Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. ready. I think we're ready. I think we're, ready. <laughs> I think we're prepped. <laughs> Hi everybody, um, my name is Kelly Fitzmaurice and I'm joined by the lovely Alice Kingdom. Um, we're going to hopefully have a very fun few hours, very fun, very informative few hours for you all. So Kelly, tell us what you do, tell us a little bit about you. I mean, I know who you are, <laughs> but these um, our guests may not, so tell us a little bit so about you. So guys, I am I'm the Head of Education for Everlasting Browse over in London in the UK. Um, we're actually streaming live now from Everlasting Head Office. Um, so I do all the teaching for all the PMU courses, for the microblading courses, for the troubleshooting courses, um, and yeah. Um, and obviously, as well as that, we also do treatments here as well. And yourself, Alice? I was going to say, don't miss out on the treatments. Oh, no. <laughs> Kelly, Kelly creates some absolutely beautiful work. If you haven't checked out Kelly's Instagram, her work is absolutely stunning. Um, I'm Alice. I'm one of the UK training team. Um, I hang around and come and annoy them all sometimes it's when they're lucky. <laughs> uh, we've not seen each other for a while though, have we? No. So I run training courses um, predominantly in the south of the UK, but um, you know I'm willing, we're always willing to come and put on courses elsewhere. So if you are a beauty school host um, and you want to host some trainings or you want to do some troubleshooting days, then it's either myself or Kelly that you'd need to reach out to. Um, and we're going to be doing some troubleshooting today, aren't we? We're going yeah. to look through a procedure from start to finish. We are. We are. We do find that sometimes people have sort of common issues. Sometimes people have common troubles when they're either microblading, PMU. We're going to try and be combining them both together as well for you guys. Um, we are going to be starting off with just a little conversation. But feel free to join in. This is what the messages are here for as well. Um, we have got one of our lovely young ladies, Angie, to uh, be taking some notes and taking some messages and questions down. So she, if they come up and we miss anything, she may well be joining in and shouting out those questions to us as well. But get yourselves ready. Um, and this is going to be quite a relaxed session. I and mean, we're calling it the A to Z because we wanted to kind of incorporate as much as possible rather than us going through the A, B and the C. We're, and rather than us having a live model here, which might take up some time, we've got a really in-depth video, which is going to enable us to walk through, show you some, um, talk a little bit about how yeah. we do procedures, um, give you a, a, the opportunity to ask questions and, and let us know about how you do yours. Um, and hopefully it'll be a really good learning experience for, for, for you. And I know that I always pick up something when I'm teaching, yep. even now. Yeah, um, most so certainly. So the idea is to, to learn and grow and share. And um, don't forget as well, this is being recorded for your benefit. So if you want to pop back in and have a watch of this at any time, we're going to email this to all of the um, registered attendees afterwards. So you can also play it back at your leisure. And also, what else have we got alongside that? Well, Ooh. we have got a little present for you all as well, which we will be popped in an email um, in the form of a lovely little discount code for you. Just love a discount code. Love a discount code. Just to say, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. So that's going to be sent out on email, isn't it? Yep, that will be sent out on email. Perfect. Okay, so should we have a little look? Shall we get started? Now, troubleshooting. There's a lot of common issues that people tend to have, whether they're microblading, doing PMU. So we're going to be work working our way through them for you. So, but first things first, what's one of the most important things? We're going to start right at the beginning, right? Yeah, right at the beginning. It's right. A, but it doesn't begin with A. Yeah, sort of A on the treatment plan. Yeah, the very first thing. thing. Also, we are both technophobes, so bear with us. <laughs> Technical hitches included for free. <laughs> <laughs> Bloopers and technical hitches. <laughs> so, <laughs> consultation. See, you already say that then. <laughs> right, first things first, consultation. Now, why do you think consultation is important, Alice? Well, I mean, it's important for you, but it's also important for your client. Mm -hmm. And when I'm teaching students, I always am impressed that it's, it's not just to tell the client what's happening. It's no. also for you as an artist. So, this is a two way conversation. Of course. You should be talking and listening in equal amount. Mm -hmm. This is the opportunity for you to find out what your client's needs are. Um, if you're doing it um, as, a separate, if, as a separate appointment to yeah. your treatment, it's, an, it's a chance to find out their wants and needs, what their goals are. Mm -hmm. It's a chance for you to look at their skin, 
it's a chance for you to check that they don't have any contraindications which are going to preclude the treatment overall and it's a chance to do things like patch test and also to build that confidence build that confidence see the canvas that you're working from as you already said I mean, obviously everyone likes a nice surprise if their client comes in, if you've not seen them browse, but sometimes it's nice for your client to know what you're going to be achieving that day rather than just the big surprise at the first appointment. Absolutely. Now a question, do you do your consultations prior to their first appointment? So um, I, it, it really depends on the client. Yeah. Um, I offer quite a flexible consultation mm -hmm. um, process. Um, I'm in that enviable position that I'm booked up quite far in advance. So if people want to have a consultation with me on a separate day, that might mean that they're waiting for their brows for a little bit longer and that's absolutely mm -hmm. fine. Um, technology means that we can do FaceTime yep. consultations. So I'm a real big fan of a FaceTime consultation. Mm -hmm. um, but luckily enough, I have both skills of being able to do hair, or all the skills of being able to do hair strokes, my, hair strokes with machine, microblading, yeah. powder. Um, and so really there isn't a client that would come in to me that I can't would deal do. with in some way, as long as I have pre-screened their, yeah. uh, their contraindications. Um, but I, I certainly think for those people that maybe aren't feeling quite so confident in their skill or are new to the industry, having a separate consultation can be really beneficial. I think, yeah, when you're very new to the industry, as you say, when you're brand new, it is a consultation face to face, is a, is a, I think it's a must. Absolutely. So you know what, what you've got coming into you. Not only obviously to check for the obvious, say your contraindications, it's also there for yourself of what you could expect to achieve. Um, and to say, if you're not versed in every skill like microblading um, or hair strokes with a machine or shading with a machine or your ombre, you need to know, obviously, if your client is suitable for the treatment that you actually And it's from a, from a planning point of view, I know that for me as a beginner, if I had someone with very little brows, that used to almost worry me yeah. because it, it was almost like the canvas was too blank. And so if I have someone come in and it was maybe something which I was a little bit nervous or anxious about, it would give me the opportunity to plan in my own mind, maybe what tools I'm going to use, what pigments I'm going to use, how I'm going to map, have a chat with them about their expectations. Mm -hmm. And then when I actually came along to doing the treatment, it's almost like the, the kind of anxiety and the weight was lifted. Uh -huh. It takes a little bit of that kind of pressure off. So mm -hmm. absolutely, if you're, if you're able to do a pre-consultation, um, even if it is by FaceTime, yeah, it face has huge, huge, huge benefits for yeah. both you and your clients. Yeah, I mean, FaceTime works really, really well because you still have that interaction. I mean, hey, we've got, sorry guys, just going to admit someone else in. <laughs> Thank you. Um, FaceTime is obviously a great opportunity for you to almost do that, as I say, face-to-face, -face, obviously, consultation. You can see, obviously, what the what you're going to achieve from your client, which is when it brings you down to sort of your expectations um, and what you're going to achieve. Um, it's always great to see the start result and then obviously in your head envisage what the end result is going to be. Yeah. And then obviously the expectations of your client to make sure that um, you're going to be able to reach that expectation or manage the client's expectations to what is realistic. Because that's another big thing. Factor. And also for looking at after the treatment itself, it gives you the opportunity to talk with your clients about what the expectations are for aftercare, what the expectations are for healing. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I sometimes have ladies that come into my clinic and they'll say, oh, it's okay. I've, you know, I've taken the next week off work. And I'll say, well, what for? Yeah. <laughs> you don't need to do that. You're going to be able to take your new brows out for dinner this evening. You do <laughs> not need to worry about, about taking time off work. So it gives you the opportunity to speak to them about um, healing and aftercare. We're going to include some advice about healing and aftercare yep. um, in our talk today. Um, so if you have any questions about how we do that or any questions about how you do it and you want um, to get our opinion on it, there are lots and lots of different ways that healing, that aftercare can be approached. Um, and the consultation is a great opportunity to say, hey, Mr. Smith, you know, you know that spin class you've got booked for Thursday night after you've had your brows done on Thursday morning? You, you're going to need to cancel that. You can't go to that. Um, take your brows out for dinner instead. Um, you know, it's an opportunity to um, to speak to them about things like that. That's literally how I say it, Kelly. You you take dinner, your right? brows out to dinner. Take your brows out for dinner. Absolutely. Uh, make dinner reservations. Does anyone else take their brows out to dinner? <laughs> just, just wondering. But you don't. <laughs> 
yeah, yeah, the consultation, yeah, is, consultation crucial. is crucial. Obviously, as well, considering your contraindications, your expectations, as you say, and your aftercare and healing. So it's for you to understand what your client expects from you and your client to understand their obviously expectations and you to manage them themselves. And that confidence that that consultation gives both you and your client can't be underestimated. No. Um, I mean, I'm at a point, and I know you're at a point, that we've done thousands of procedures. Mm. Um, this is really something that almost comes second nature yeah. now. But for a client, this isn't something that they do every day. Um, and to give them the confidence in you, to for them to understand even just where your clinic is, what it looks like, gets them mentally prepared and, and relaxed. Of course. Um, Sometimes you just have clients, which I did, I've had one actually this week. Um, she's like, I just want to come and meet you and see the clinic and see how it is, get the feel. Get feel for a place. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> make sure she knows. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, just to get a feel for the place. Um, and again, that's just as great because that's how they build their confidence with you. And um, that's how they learn to trust you as well. Indeed. So extremely important. It's a big thing. Trusting someone to mark your face is, is huge. Oh, yeah. It's huge. So yeah, a consultation really does help to bed that down of and course. make sure that everybody starts off on the right foot. Of course. But also, what is also important, excuse my back. Now, do we think the age of a client is important? Well, you never ask a lady their age. Well, of course you don't. <laughs> of course you don't. But we can obviously tell if someone's got mature skin, yeah. if they've got young skin. Um, I would say avoiding asking their age is probably a good, <laughs> probably a good thing. Although but, well, some consultation forms, it does have a well, yes. date of birth. Well, because we need to have that for legal yes. reasons, especially And this is what I was going to say. We can kind of tell, though, if a lot by looking at someone, if they are, you know, if they're in the category of 20 to 30, yeah. 30 to 40, mm -hmm. 40 to 50, 50 to 60. Um, and yeah, age does come into it, right? It does. It does come in. It comes it. into the kind of look that they might, might want, um, how bold they might want it. Um, but more importantly, it's about their skin. Their skin, about their skin texture, the thickness of the skin, the sensitivity of the skin. Um, I mean, I don't know, obviously different ages work in different ages as you have, um, Alice. The skin can heal completely differently from someone that says 18 to someone that's, I say 80, I've done an 80 year old before, <laughs> but you can, as I say, the skin can heal very differently, the pigment can heal differently, the strokes, if you're going to be doing, say, microblading. Now, obviously, everyone has different opinions about microblading and powder brows. Yeah. Um, depending on the age of the client. Personally, what I've seen throughout, obviously, many treatments that I've done, a microblading client um, is more suitable for an age, say, maybe under the age of, say, I don't want to say 40 because I'm in that situation. <laughs> Ages. We weren't going to ask people ages, <laughs> Kelly. I'm leaving if you don't ask me my age. <laughs> no, so, so it's a nice, clean, clear skin canvas. It's what we need, don't yes, we? Absolutely. Someone that is a little bit, skin that's a little bit smoother is the best way I think. I'd it is. What most light we But you know, that also depends on the client. I mean, the oldest client that I've ever microbladed um, was in her early 90s, but wow. her skin was incredible. Her skin was incredible and, you know, the blades and the products and the colours that I chose in that scenario were completely different to the ones that I might have chosen if she was in front of me and she was 25. Yeah, exactly. Completely different. Um, and, you know, you've still got to, it's, it's not something that I would have done regularly. This lady was very, very much committed to the kind of look that she was after. This um, is it. And you know what? I think she said something to me like, I'm 90 years old. I just just do what you think that, that, mm -hmm. that I would like. But generally, for our thicker, more fragile skins, we want to consider whether a powder or a combination exactly. option yeah. they're going to, to heal better. To heal better, look, look better. better. Um, mm -hmm. be, and again, down to the skill, um, it takes a really, really soft, really really light hand mm. on a on a more fragile sensitive most skin, definitely right? most definitely um, so yes i would certainly say that blading blading fragile skins is not something to be taken lightly or, not, well it is something it to be taken, taken lightly, lightly. <laughs> um, but it's not something that you undertake um without thinking about and without making sure that you've got that real um that you've really honed your skill before you do that and that's the thing that's what i was going to say it's like not necessarily for your second client to go no. out and do an 80 year old no not at all um, but it's the same, not going back to age, it's all about the skin texture. This is. And the skin, as you say, the skin sensitivity, the skin thickness, and 
a skin smoothness we, shall we say we're going to come along to talk about things like um face shapes and things towards the end of the presentation when we've got some recapping and we'll, i think we'll cover shapes and um, retention and retention yeah. and things like how to create a modern look and how mm -hmm. to make someone look a little bit fresher and things like that we'll cover mm -hmm. that as well won't we mm -hmm. okay so next what we're going to be doing we're going to start working our way just for a video just to talk you through now this is a great um adaptation of obviously a, um, a combination graph we're going to be going through so we're going to be showing you two skills one microblading and two machine shading and um, we're going to start the procedure right at the very beginning i'm just going to play that and the nice thing about doing it this way is that neither of us have to actually worry about doing a client we can just give you all of our best tips um, sometimes when you're um, demonstrating or teaching you are in a position where you have to actually be concentrating on teaching and concentrating on doing the procedure at the time at the same time um, whereas with this we can we can give a really nice run through of what's happening so our first steps kelly so first steps first things first is cleansing so we need to make sure that client's skin is extremely clean squeaky clean free from any makeup and the, well, we tend to use the juicy prep pads as well they are like sort of 90 percent um alcohol yeah. Um, and what that would do, that won't only cleanse um, the skin, it will make sure, obviously, it's completely um, sanitised. Do we want to have a quick pause and have a look at one of those? Have a quick pause. So these are brilliant. Um, I would, yeah, we want to sanitise the skin, but we want to get rid of makeup. Um, also, we also want to sometimes, it's, it's good to dehydrate the skin slightly. Yes, if you've got a very oily client, then definitely. I love the way that these smell. I love the smell of these. These are um, an alcohol wine. But they're huge look how big they are so you can do you can do a lot of cleansing with these um i'm opening this because i get a little bit excited you uh, just want the smell uh, don't you i do yeah <laughs> i do um you can use them you can use them to cleanse the skin beforehand yep. um they're also really good for when you're mapping and just kind yep. of detailing around the mapping aren't they but they're they're really big they're not those little tiny teeny no sometimes you get like the, the, um, the little postage stamp yeah. size ones which you just kind of go like this with your finger um that's why i wanted to show exactly what these look like because they're they're really great value they're a really good size and they're um, quite saturated as they well are, in fact i always have a couple of these in my handbag yeah um, you know what great as well if you want to cast out a quick hand sanitizer they are they are very good so juicy wipes brilliant We're yeah in front of those. very good yeah say for de slightly dehydrating the skin as well so if we slightly dehydrate the skin it does also the skin then wants to accept as much moisture as you're going to be putting in yeah so by opening the skin and when we put in the pigment in the skin is going to absorb a lot of that pigment um, when we're opening so another good little tip for using the juicy powder. and if you're dehydrating the skin slightly before you start working with something like a something like the juicy pad um it means that your pencil sticks on the skin oh, yeah. so if you've ever had one of those skins where you think my pencil is just not doing my pencil well, doesn't work my pencil's not working <laughs> um it may well be that there is still oil there is still makeup or something on the skin um and using one of these pads will, will really help to um to remove that and make sure that your surface is clean and primed and ready for you to do your beautiful mapping i'm not going to put move the video on anymore because i'm going to pause it here for numbing okay so pre-numbing i know i've spoken to artists out there that don't necessarily pre-numb pre personally i do always pre-numb um, I tend to use the Zenza. Zenza tends to have um, a less rate of any form of um, allergen. Yeah. Um, because finding any other, some other um, anaesthetics out there have a lot of ingredients in them that some people can tend to be allergic to. Yeah. Um, the Zenza generally stays on for 20 to 30 minutes, depending on your um, on your timings 20 minutes is the least what i yeah. really like about zenza is pre numbs it doesn't ch tend to change the texture of the skin That's what I was gonna go so to next. a lot of artists um don't like pre numbing because they're worried that it's going to change the the feel um the, the feel of the skin yeah, it's sort of that, that it's going to give it that hard, rubbery, rubbery feeling feel, and you don't get that with zenza um it, zenza doesn't tend to have that kind of absorbative um, I think I might have made that word up. Doesn't seem, doesn't seem to <laughs> make the skin absorb, you know, doesn't seem to make the skin spongy like lots of other yeah. products do. Um, and I think that, um, you know, when, when you do research and when you ask your clientele what are the reasons that maybe they haven't gone ahead and had this treatment sooner, 
for a number of them, it will be discomfort. So to keep your, com your clients comfortable, and if it's not going to change the texture of the skin, and if it's a really good product that isn't going to be causing an irritation, then that's only a win-win in my book. Of course, of course. Now, when we're numbing as well, this is another thing that we're going to come to. I mean, I see some people that map first, then numb, and then I see some people that numb and then map. That all does boil down to how long it takes you to draw your client's brows, of course, yeah. which is a little step that we're going to get onto a bit later. What's your preference? My preference is numbing, then mapping. Ah, see, I'm the other way around. What, you map, then numb? I map, then numb. Oh, I'm very quick at numbing. We've had this conversation yeah, before. Very we're going to have, have a mapping race mapping num at, some, at some point. Not today. No. <laughs> not today, we're not. But we've discussed no. about having a, a mapping yeah. race before. Um, I just Matt like Lincoln. to. I just like to know that my shape is in yeah. before I know. I think it just take. I think that when I very again when I first started, it used to take me so long to map that I just got into the habit of mapping and then putting my numbing on first. Again, no right, no right or wrong. There's no right or wrong way of doing it. No, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, just sometimes I feel it depends obviously on, on the tools that you're using to draw your pre-draw by sometimes then taking off the numb if it doesn't absorb completely into the skin because sometimes it does when wiping off. It sometimes can move your pre-draw but then obviously that's obviously from my experience yeah, yes, absolutely so as i say no right or wrong way um and this can be used for either i think that's yeah. the thing um and this is what kelly and i were saying before the, the really interesting thing about pmu and one of the reasons that we wanted to do this together was so that you've got that kind of dual opinion mm -hmm. and the, the different things of, of how um how we both like to work in a similar but also a very different way so yeah senza i always pre numb um, yeah and senza always pre numb much. yes I mean, guys, let us know. I mean, do you always pre-numb? Is there a reason that you don't pre-numb? Let us know. We want you to join in as well. <laughs> okay, so as I say, we like to, obviously, when we're numbing, we like to make sure that there is a nice, thick layer of numbing, making sure that it's sort of in the brow area, through the brow area, and especially, obviously, with this lady, we're going to be making her brows slightly wider. So you want to make sure that we're just not going where the hair is. We want to go slightly thicker. Um, because we want to make sure that it's as comfortable as it can be for the client. Now, saying that, numbing doesn't always work. So it works on most people, the yes. majority, but you still might have someone that may slightly feel a little bit of pain. But, you know, my, my feeling on this is is that really it's discomfort rather yeah. than pain. Oh, yeah. Um, I always try and avoid the word pain, especially mm -hmm. when talking to my clients, because that kind of sets your mind off into thinking, you know, but it's I, always the fine. first question that everyone asks. Yes. Is it painful? But it painful? if you've got a really, if you've numbed for 20 minutes, if you've got a really nice stretch on the skin, if you're using good quality tools, then it should be comfortable. We're going to talk about things like stretch. As yep, well. we're going to be talking about stretch and section. So about 20 minutes, um, I always like to put a little bit of cling, cling film. You can, you can include, it's um, not, yeah. And, and again, going back in there with the juicy pad just to make sure that any residue that has been wiped off the skin. And making sure it's even nice and clean. Now, here is the big guns, the mapping. So we were just discussing, mapping can take us anything, well, for myself, about approximately 10 minutes. So for yourself, approximately, well, approximately 10 minutes. Other people, should we pause? Other people, it can take anything up to, as I've heard, about an hour. And it's not a race, it's not. If that's how long it takes you, that's how long it takes. The important thing is that you're you're doing it with precision and you're doing it with care and that you are speaking with your client about what her wants and her needs are. Mm -hmm. um, in this particular video, we're using some thread, aren't we? Yep. Thread the so there are so many different tools which you can employ um, mm. to help you make this easy. And I love this method with the with the white thread. I find with the mapping, and the one thing is with the mapping, no two people have the same face shape. No two people have the same bone structure. No two people, in which case, should have exactly the same brows. How boring would our job be if we did the same brows? Exactly. I mean, I've seen a lot of tools out there on the market, um, a lot of stencils, stamps. I don't like them. <laughs> really? Uh, You're yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not. No. I'm not a fan. Of not a fan. States, stencils, stencils, uh, stamps, anything like that. Um, so by using the brow method or the brow mapping method, um, we're going to be following the uh, bone structure of the client's face. We're going to be looking at their face shape, 
Um, we and look at any existing hair any that's existing there. Hair that's there because we do also want to salvage as much of that existing hair as we possibly can. I always say it's a bit like a recipe. Yeah. You have to look at all of it. There's there's kind of your favourite recipe which you might have, um, and there are there are kind of rules, but those rules can be massaged a little bit. So if you have someone whose ends maybe are looking a little bit sad, you can lift them slightly, but what we don't want to do is to take the whole tail off no. because that's giving your client a maintenance issue moving forward. Um, but using tools and using tools that can see where your where your levels are, where the levels of the brow bone um, starts, which is what's being shown here. This is the, the bottom of the brow bone. And using, um, using something to mark that. So this is thread with a little bit of our white pigment. Inbal. Um, this is inbal. Um, and what you do with this is you just put a couple of little drops of it onto your onto your tray or onto something else that's that's clean that's going to be disposed of. Um, and your thread, you just have nice and taut and just kind of dip in, dip into the, the thread so that it, it carries some of that pigment. Set it down for a couple of minutes. Yes, the biggest big, tip. The biggest tip, because if you go straight in and that pigment is really wet, you can create quite a mess. Mm. Um, these lovely, precise, fine lines are created after that pigment has been on the string, probably only for 30 seconds or yeah. so, 30 seconds to a minute. Um, but but yes, you do need to you do need to wait. Um, and it will give you these, as you can see, these really nice precise lines to draw to draw your brow shape. And um, what we've done here, or Monica's done here, is we've created a central line down the centre of the face or the centre of the forehead to make sure we've got that symmetry, to make sure we've got the symmetry either side. Um, once we've done that, we are going to stick the ruler, or we're going to stuck the ruler on and making sure that the ruler, or the centre of the ruler, is measured with that line, um, that central line. And what's really clever about these rulers, if you've not used the Everlasting Brows rulers before, you can see on the model behind us, and you can see here, they have these little windows, they have these little windows in the beautiful um, turquoisey, blue, minty green colour. So this takes some of the guesswork out of it for you. If you're placing the centre of your measuring tape on that line, and that line is nice and accurate, these little windows are for the start, the arches, and the ends of your eyebrows. Um, so it does take a bit of guesswork mm. out. And you're using those face shape, you're using mm. that existing brown hair that we talked yeah. about, looking at the client's face shape, even if they, and if they have no hair, then you can use you can use these as a guide. Mm. So it's just, again, one of those, coming back to when we were talking about the consultation, it's about taking the guesswork out of yeah. what you're doing. Making um, your job that um, little bit easier. Absolutely, absolutely. Exactly what um, yeah. and, and so if you hadn't, if you use these rulers and you hadn't realised that that's what these are for, um, it's more than about it just being pretty colours. That's yeah. an indicator <laughs> um, to give you an idea of where your brows should start, arch and finish. Um, really useful. And if I just pause this here, I'm just going to show you that you can see here um, that the lines aren't just um, a sort of a network of lines. There are a reason for each individual one. We've made one for the lower part of the brow. We've made one for the um, thickest part of the brow. We've made one for the highest point of the brow. And then we've made one for where the brow should start, where the arch should be, and when the tail should be. And then the rest is just a game of joining dot to dot. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Which you will now see, which is what we're doing here with the thread. Now this always looks easier said than done. Mm -hmm. I know when I first started doing string method, it just looked like a lot of lines. But once you understand which line is your bottom line, which line is your thickness line, which line is your top line, which is your start, arch and finish, yep. you can then build that shape super easy, super easily. So you can see here what we're doing is drawing sort of the underneath line. Because sometimes, especially with your thread, if someone's got a little bit of a prominent brow bone, it can be hard to use your thread it can be. to measure it around. Sorry, could you please turn, put your um, zoom on to mute? I think someone's just joined us. So this is the, white, this is the white brow wow pencil um, that's being used. This is such a lovely creamy texture, uh -huh. really nice creamy texture. Um, I often find that some white pencils are, are, are really soft, soft, too, too soft. Yeah. yeah. 
So this is this is a soft pencil. It's not hard because um, it, it isn't, but it's a really nice, almost a waxy, yeah, creamy consistency. And so it glides on the skin, really. and it also stays well on the skin. It does. The white pencil. I mean, the pencils do come in sort of a white. Uh, we've got a blondie. We've got a medium brown. We've got an intense brown. So you can use obviously whichever is best for your individual client. But most importantly, their skin safe. And they're being mapped around the whole brow here. In this video, the whole brow is being covered around in white. This isn't something that you need to do, but if you do it, you'll see here, it really makes that shape pop. So if you've been worried about doing your mapping and then maybe not really being clear on exactly where you need to start yep. your strokes or start your powdering, um, to outline in something like um, the uh, the white the, the white brow wow pencil um, can really help with that. Yeah, and also we've got um, the other concealer pencil, which is also really good for that. Uh -huh. So if you don't like the white, if you prefer the concealer, those are a couple of different options that mm -hmm. you've got. Um, and I must admit, I never start, especially a powder brow. I never start a powder brow without going around it with concealer. Oh really? It, <laughs> it's my um, it, it just helps me to really see accurately mm. where I where I want to go. Um, so that's that's definitely a good one. And just another little tip here. What I just saw if you saw Monica there. She just got her thread out and just measured the top of the brow. Now, one thing I will say is your your thread is your best friend. Your thread throughout your procedure, throughout your mapping, is your best friend. Don't just use it for your mapping and just get rid of it. Keep it with you at all times. Keep it on your tray at all times. Because whenever you're working all the way through, whether you're, you are, um, you're doing your strokes or if you're doing a powder brow, your thread is always there as your best friend to make sure that the, the brows are consistently um, symmetrical. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You can use it physically on the skin. You can use it as something which you just use as a line to give you a reference point sort of visually, mm -hmm. um, lots and lots of different ways that you can that you can use that. And if you do lose your, if you lose your place, if you lose your way, please don't be afraid to stop and remap. Um, of course. You know, you know, there's so many people that of lose course. their mapping and get really stressed out about it and really worried and it then knocks your confidence. You take a step back, get your string out and remap. Then Always. start again. Yeah. As I say, don't do not be worried about that. Because you can I think go back to that. Step. I sometimes think people tend to let me just pause that a little. I sometimes think people tend to think that because they've mapped and because they've drawn they've drawn the brows and they've done their first pass, I think people tend to think that that's it. They're done. No, they're they're done. That's their map and that's all they can do. Um, but obviously, what we do obviously is obviously using your thread and keep on using it, keep on using it to make sure that the set they're the same height. Um, you can keep the ruler on as well. Yeah. Another big tip, yeah. keep that ruler on throughout the procedure. That's why it's sticky, that's why it's there. That's why it's not reusable and it's disposable because you keep it on throughout the treatment. You can also use your ruler even if you take it off. Um, if you want to do things like check that the thickness are the same, once you've taken this off, you can, I'm gonna mm -hmm. use you as a model, Kelly. You can have a look and, and see, you know, is this brow and this brow the same thickness using your ruler? So this does not need to get thrown away at the end of your mapping, no. um, your, your original mapping. Keep it, keep, it on. keep it on your tray, keep your string handy, um, keep a mapping pencil somewhere separate, not on your contaminated tray. Um, and, and if you need to go back to mapping, then 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 do it. That's what you that's what you can do. Um, another uh, another good thing to do is actually to to almost not totally remap at the end, but mm -hmm. check before you finish. Yeah. How many times, Kelly, have you looked in the mirror at, at a photo that you've taken of a client and thought, you know what, I thought they were really even when I mapped them, and now I'm finished and I've taken the photo and my lady has left or my gentleman has left. There's something that doesn't look quite right. Yeah. So you can always use your tool right at the end, end to yeah. check. Mapping isn't just about the beginning. Yeah. Mapping is something which which can happen throughout the treatment. Of course, of course. And that's what I say. And I encourage, I do encourage everybody, whether you're a beginner, whether you've been doing it five, ten years, I do encourage people to do that. Again, to make your life and your job a lot easier. Because otherwise, as you say, sometimes you can look at people's brows and you think, Something's a bit off, but you can't work out what yeah. it is. Yeah. But then the way you can do it is by getting your thread and just mapping over again. Have a little look. And that will basically determine, obviously, 
where you may need to add another little bit of stroke or a little bit more um, shading or maybe one's a little bit longer than the other and uh, maybe one's slightly thicker than the other and things do happen while you're working you know it is easy to lose your outline mm -hmm. sometimes it is easy for when you then sit your client up at the end to think oh you know i mapped them and they were the same they measured the same but our faces and our skulls aren't the same. No. So if you find that you need to put an extra stroke on this end, but actually technically the measurements are now out, but it looks, looks right, perfect. Then, then use your tools, use your artistic eye, um, and don't be afraid to use those tools and use your eye throughout the procedure to check that you're on the right track. Okay, okay. Now here, here we're going straight into the procedure. As you can see Monica's using um, Kim here for her uh, pigment. Now, and I think that's the eyebrow as well, make sure. Um, as you can see, obviously we know, tend to use a pigment ring, especially with microblading. I always find it a lot easier to have sort of your pigment ring on the finger and work back and forth rather than trying to work from a dispense on a tray. Can I just interrupt and say how clever you and I are? Oh, I know how clever <laughs> We were watching this video before and we didn't know what pigments oh. we use. And we both went, it looks like she's used Yo-Yo or Kim. Or Kim. And it's, here we are. So a testament to how clever Kelly and I are and how um, well, how easy it is to get to know the Everlasting Brows pigment range. <laughs> I was waiting for that. <laughs> Right, now one little thing I'm going to say before we start over as we're working here, we're starting obviously at the front of the brown. We're going to be following a pattern as well. The pattern we will obviously talk about talk about a little bit later. Um, but one important thing is, as you can see, with Monica's hands and where Monica's hands are sitting. Now you can see we're stretching. Now one of the biggest and most important parts when we're working... Stretch. Is stretch, 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 baby, stretch. stretch. We're not going to be stretching their skin off, obviously, but we, we want to stretch. We want a nice, smooth base to work from. You almost can't overstretch, can you? No. You almost can't. Um, you don't want your client to be uncomfortable. Um, you know, we don't want to be putting a physical pressure on their head. But in terms of a stretch, you almost can't mm -hmm. overstretch. Um, we, we see... Um, a lot of um, therapists maybe that come from a spa or a beauty background where everything is very centered around um, you know gentle touch and you know it's important that we do touch lightly and gently but we need to be confident with our stretch mm -hmm. and we need to make sure that our, you know a, a good firm stretch not only is going to help that blade glide through the skin give us a crisper stroke and um, better retention um, be more comfortable, but it also make, makes our clients feel confident in, in, in what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Whereas we, if we kind of are light and, them. <laughs> if we're light and lovely, it, 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 it doesn't give you that same confidence. Mm -hmm. So please do not be afraid, don't be afraid to, stretch it. to stretch. We also really. want to make sure we're implementing the pigment as well. Yeah. Because obviously the skin isn't just like a, a flat surface. No. Um, where we're implementing the pigment. Obviously, on the tops, it's not always a flat surface, as we were talking earlier about sort of the smoothness of the skin. But our base and layer underneath it's a the wiggly skin little is connected one. like this. <laughs> it's a wiggly yeah. little one. It doesn't move, obviously. <laughs> it's just connected like that. Um, and we want to make sure that we're sort of hitting the same level with your pigment. Um, if not, generally, what can happen is you can end up with broken lines in your stroke. Um, and that's generally because you just haven't implemented the pigment enough. Yeah. Um, and sometimes, obviously, you can. It's, have you ever had a client come back to you um, when they come back, and obviously you've got a nice line, and then it sort of dots at the yeah. end or dots in the middle? That's a classic inconsistency yeah. of stroke. And, and, and stretch is so important. It's an inconsistency of yeah, your stretch, your pressure as well, mm -hmm. because obviously if we're putting our blade in and we're coming on from a bit wiggly like this, and you haven't got the confidence um, to stretch and to implement the pigment with your pressure. Again, that's gonna cause you to have dotted lines. And I do see this actually quite a lot yeah. um, with a lot and of students. And it's relatively students. easily rem remedied once you realize what it is and you can put it into action. Um, I can see there's a question someone's asking about how, um, how to not mess up your lines. That's a lot about finger placement. Yeah. Again, it's Again. Pra practice. If you can watch here, Monica's obviously stretching her hands here. And then you'll find, I'm going to stand up slightly, she's holding her blade here, and then she's using her pinky to stretch 
under here to making sure we're avoiding obviously the pre-draw area because you say if you start stretching and pulling on the pre-draw you're going to start messing it up a yeah. little yeah. so generally as you say it's more about obviously finger placement making sure you're comfortable as well because obviously when you're working I think that's another thing we're going to show through how Monica's going to save the shape as well yeah. with her first with her first pass yeah um but yes definitely when you're on your first you know on, when you're first visiting the skin um stay away from your pre-draw with your stretching fingers you want your stretch to be as small and as tight as possible but you don't want it to be on that pre-draw because if you're on the pre-draw it's going to get messed up if your pre-draw does get messed up danielle go back and pop it in you could Just always pop again. again you know if you stretch and you think oh i've taken the tail off with my finger stop what you're doing pick up your string Put it back in. There is start yeah. the There is no shame or worry in having to go back and redo that because no. everyone's done it. Absolutely. Um, as you say, and everyone can accidentally map and wipe it off. We definitely Just, don't want to guess. No, and that's the worst thing. I think a lot of people get panic and they go, "Oh God, I've done this. Well, let me just guess where to put it." We're not guessing. No. Yeah, someone's face. So go back in, map again. And as you say, once you've got the mapping technique down to a T. It won't take you long to go in and remap. So Monica's fingers at the front um, with her um, left hand with her pigment ring on. If you see her stretch here, the stretch at the front for this moment in time hasn't really moved. But as Kelly mentioned, as she's working along the brow, she's using the fingers, the, the fingers that aren't holding the blade to stretch that skin down from the brow bone to support the skin so that that stroke is going to be implemented in a consistent, even, in a consistent, even fashion. So you'll see she's almost creating a, a triangle. Uh, that's why we call it a three point stretch. Um, it's because there are three points on the skin where we are moving and pulling that triangle apart. If you've never done this, it's an interesting thing to do a, a two point stretch and then add that third finger. Okay. Even when you're not working, just try it on a client next time. Maybe when you, you know, before you start, um, try it on your husband, your best friend, your girlfriend, um, you know, see see how the skin reacts and how implementing that third point makes all the difference in but the stretch. Also, that third point, not only is it good for a stretch, it's good for uh, <laughs> can't speak today, but the stability of your blade and adjusting your pressure. Yeah. Because there's nothing worse than working on the client and sort of and your hovering, hands hovering. Yeah, hovering right. with your blade. You need that hand to be nice and stable um, to ensure that you're sort of implementing the pigment in the same with the same pressure. And it's taking that guesswork out again. It's guess, something yeah. we're gonna come back to again and again and again. Make life easy for yourself. Don't hover over, you know, with a two a two hand two finger stretch on one hand and then hover. Plant your hand down, um, get your stability, get that third point of stretch, and then visit the skin. Make sure that you're going into the skin correctly the first time. Mm -hmm. And actually, you know, even if that takes you a while to, to get your hands, get your elbows, get your body in the right position, it will pay dividends. Yeah, definitely. You need to get yourself comfortable. I think one of the um, one of the questions I get a lot when training, it's like, so how do you sit? How do you work? How do you do this? How do you do that? What's comfortable for me may not necessarily be what's comfortable for you. Mm -hmm. Or one tip I would say is you're not you're not a tree, you're not planted, you can move. Yeah. Yeah. And your, and your client's head can yeah, move. Yeah, your client's head can move. You can move. We have stalls our wheels on, as we've tested. Now our stalls have wheels. We can move round our client. We can twist, <laughs> we can work from the front, we can work from the back. You need to be comfortable whilst you're working. And I think that's a very important factor. Because if you're uncomfortable, if you're not in a good position where maybe your back's hurting or you don't know where to put your arm, you need to be comfortable. I have yourself. an analogy again. They all come back to food. It's all recipes or something food related with me. Go for it's it. eating your dinner. When you eat your dinner, right. you have your dinner in front of you because yeah. that's what's comfortable. You know, when you go to a restaurant, your, your table is in front of you. It's not to the side. Where's this going? Well, in, in terms of making sure <laughs> yeah, that your yeah. client's head okay. is in the right place, Got that you. you're in a comfortable way. If you're trying to do something here, sit yourself 
so that what you're doing is right, right in front of you. Right, at a good front. level. At a good level, make sure your stool goes up and down. If, you, if you're lucky enough to have a bed that goes up and down, get, a, a, you know, even for things like your posture yep. for long term, making sure you're in the right position makes all the difference. Of course. Makes all the difference. Um, so yes, you know, have a think about it. Next time you do a set of brows, think, where would I eat my dinner? Would I eat my dinner? Would I eat my dinner over here? No. I'm gonna. I want it where I can. Where I can sit. Any where I can sit. Um, that do, analogy doesn't work if you sit eating your dinner on the side of the sofa. But if you think about it, <laughs> that's not the best way, and it's not the most comfortable way. It is just sometimes a habit that we get into. So, you know, if your strokes aren't coming back in, aren't coming back consistently, check your stretch. Yep. Check your position. Check that you're moving your body and that you're moving your client's head. So that you get so that you get the most of that position. Of course. Now here, very conveniently, we have just finished off what looks like the first part. Beautiful strokes. And as you can see, Monica's managed to outline the brow just with her brow pattern. Now we should be after this first pass, if you can see when she wipes off. I love wiping the brows after that first pass. Oh, that's magic. Yeah, it's exciting. She's not scared of that pre-draw being lost. And the reason you'll find that she's not scared of that pre-draw being lost is because she's managed to um, map the whole brow with her strokes. It's like a skeleton, yeah. isn't it? It's what we've done. We've put in, we put in the bones or bones of the, the bones of the brow. Okay, so here, what are we doing here now? We are numbing again, okay? So it can sometimes happen. Um, that your client, I mean, it's not a necessity to, to numb no. in between each pass. It's not a necess necessity to, to numb at all. At all. <laughs> no. <laughs> we just do it for the kindness, for our own kindness. I like, I like my clients to yeah. like me. I always say, you're going to like me more if I put some numbing on. So that's why. So here we're using the secondary um, anaesthetic, okay? The Zenzo is brilliant for working on your um, unbroken skin. But we tend to, for our secondary anaesthetic, we tend to use like the Feel Better, the Feel Better gel. You can use sensor on broken skin though. Yeah. It's just not quite so strong. No. Yeah, but the difference is obviously between your sensor and your secondary anaesthetic and your Feel Better is your Feel Better does have epinephrine in it. It does, so it's much stronger yeah. and it's going to work quicker. And also with the epinephrine, that does also help to, um, it acts as a vasoconstrictor. So it does help to restrict those blood capillaries. Therefore, if you do have a client that tends to be what I class as a bit of a bleeder. Sometimes you do have a client that when they have a few droplets of blood coming out. Tends to be those people that are lighter in skin tone. More flushed. Yeah, because you you know, you know have more, Me. there are more. <laughs> yeah, like Kelly, Kelly bleeds, Kelly bruises. I bleed and, bruise. <laughs> but you know, from a comfort point of view, also it's, 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 another, it's another win. Of course, yeah. It's comfortable, it helps to keep your strokes nice and clean. What I on. like about Feel Better Now is it's not sticky mm -hmm. like some of the other brands that you might get. Yeah. Um, so you secondary numbing, some of them are very, very liquidy. Some of them are um, are um, like a, almost like a Vaseline consistency mm -hmm. and then some of them are creamy. Um, this one is a gel, but it's not a sticky gel. It's not tacky. So when you come to wipe it off of the skin, it wipes off really yep. nice and easily. Mm -hmm. um, you can also get just a really small amount on a little micro brush like this, and that's all you need. It's yep. a tiny, tiny little amount, and it doesn't change the texture of the skin either. No, not at all. Not at all. Another little point I was going to add um, about, obviously, it having the epinephrine in it, is sometimes you ever find, if you do have a client that has sensitive skin like myself, um, that tends to bleed a little bit more than, say, an say, average client, um, Sometimes you might find that the retention's not also great mm -hmm. because if you've got a client that um, is having a little bit, little bit more blood coming out, generally that's going to be tending to push the pigment out. Yeah, it's like washing the strokes out from yeah. the inside out, right? Completely, because obviously your blood's there, obviously to protect the skin. It's like, hey, what's this going in my skin? Mm -hmm. So it's rushing to the surface. So I say by having the um, epinephrine in it, that's going to help so to restrict those blood capillaries, pull that blood black, black blood, blood back. Well, I can't believe this. <laughs> blood back um, 
and keep the skin nice and clear for your pigment to be able to be implemented well. It's pH safe for eyes and lips. I guess it is, That's definitely. Right. I love Zenza on lips. Zenza on lips, um, Zenza, feel better now on lips is, is fantastic. So the reason I bought here is just because of what we are doing here is you can see that we've got the skeleton strokes as Alice said. Um, also we're going in here and we're using a slightly different technique um, just to reinforce some strokes because with your first pass, especially as a new client, when you have a new client coming in, we're not quite sure. We can't look at you and say, oh, your skin is this thick. It's going to work like this. It's going to work. When are you inventing that? That would be, <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> I don't think it's possible. <laughs> so your first pass, you always want to try and work almost sort of superficially. Yeah, you always want to sort of keep... I would say a little bit of a lighter hand slightly until you get used to that skin because once them strokes are implemented you can then go back in and just add a little tiny bit more pigment now we're not talking going back in and trying to open the skin again no, we don't need to beef them up do <laughs> no what we want to do is just go and just gently stroke um, and implement in some more pigment it's almost like a tickle yeah it's almost like a tickle or a hover. There's never any more pressure. Again, your stretch has really got to be on point. Okay. You've got to almost be, um, you, you, you know, you, you want that you want that stretch so that you can get the accuracy of yep. your blade where you want it to be. You don't want to be causing any crazy kind of double strokes. No. Um, but no. yes, we've, we've you just... You need to check, at this point, you need to check your lighting, yes. your stretch, yes. and your eyesight. Absolutely. <laughs> Most of all, I think the eyesight is very important, as you say, because when working back inside a stroke, the last thing you want to do is to go next to it. Because by going next to that stroke, you're going to create, as you say, a double stroke. And in some cases, they can blur together and create one big thick stroke. And if you're not confident with creating, yeah. with revisiting a, a stroke in the skin, this can be practiced on latex. So mm. when we've talked about going, what you know, it's not going backwards to do latex practice. Um, I still spend a lot of time on latex. I know oh, I love it as well. I love it. I find it really therapeutic. Yes. And in a strange own, way. My zen, it doesn't, yeah. My zen zone. Yeah, most definitely. But you can use latex to practice hitting those strokes and hovering in them and being super light. Um, but yes, it's, it, we, we need to make sure that we've got a, a good saturation of mm -hmm. um, pigment without being heavier, heavy handed, big thing them up. Big thing them up. I love that. <laughs> also, another thing. Um, that I will say is obviously talking about the amount of pigment that we're using on the blade. Because I think sometimes when we're working, people think, right, I need to scoop that pigment out, I need to put as much as I can on the blade and place it in the skin. Now that's going to cause a whole host of problems yourself. Mess. But, yeah, more of a mess. Mess. And to be fair, guys, I am a little bit of a messy worker, but um, we do need to make sure that we can see where we're putting our strokes. Yeah? And by... Um, by having too much pigment on our blade, what that's going to do, it's almost going to blow out where you've actually implemented your stroke. So by you, it's really hard for you then to put another stroke next to yes. it to create a consistent pattern. Especially on those first ones where you're doing, um, where you're creating a skeleton. Yeah. Um, you know, you want your strokes to be close enough together that you've got that, um, you know, the bones of the, the bones of the brow to work mm -hmm. to. But if you can't see because you're, you know, you're creating two or three millimetres worth of pooling, of puddling of pigment, mm -hmm. then it's, it, you just can't see. Um, a top tip with this is don't, don't look for your blade going in the pigment just look at your pigment ring and see when the surface tension gets broken yeah so if you've got good lighting there'll be like a shine on the top of your pigment and you'll know when you've got enough pigment on your um, blade just that that blade has touched the surface mm -hmm. um, so rather than having a look and trying to see exactly what you've got um, you can do it from further away just by checking just by seeing that surface tension breaking in the pigment in the pigment ring you know that you've got enough that's all you need. You just need enough. Yeah, you just need the tips. Yeah, if you're sort of getting, if you're getting your blade right and you're just sort of scooping the pigment out or you're completely covering all those little micro needles with pigment, that's that's far. And too. I always work with a little cotton round in my glove mm -hmm. so that as I go, I can safely wipe my blade because you know it, it, it will get full of pigment. It as will do eventually. Well, pigment. 
pigment will dry. Yeah. Um, you know, you might get a little odd brow hair that gets caught in there. Keep your blade nice and clean. And as Kelly says, work with minimal pigment. Yeah, most definitely. Because as I say, as you can see, I mean, if you can see this, we will send close-ups as well. But you can see that you've got the skeleton of the brow. You can see the pigment. In actual fact, it's quite hard to detect the difference between the strokes the here, strokes. the strokes and the actual natural hair. But you've got, retained the shape by doing that first pass, by working with the pattern, by making sure that we're hitting the front of the brow, the arch, the towel, and the thickness, we've retained that pre-draw. Easy once you know how. Very easy once you know mm -hmm. how. But it, I mean, the thing is, we're about making life easier. I don't know why sometimes people don't want to make their life easier as into carrying out the treatment. If it means you mapping again, it means you mapping again. If it means you following a pattern to basically get your pre-draw and keep it, then do it. It's about making your treatment easier. And if your treatment's easier or your process is easier, then it's going to make you the better artist because then obviously you can then focus on other areas. So Monica's just checking, um, checking that initial skeleton stroke, skeleton of strokes. Um, she's now going back in and filling some gaps. Um, she's also filling some of the existing strokes with a little bit more pigment. Um, so these steps all tend to kind of start getting combined into one. You've done your initial um, shape, you're then having a look, you're revisiting, you're adding, mm -hmm. you're, you're editing the whole time that you're going along and, and adding. But if you do need to take a step back, well, you're all about always taking a taking a step back to have a look to see what you need to do before you can move forward. And sometimes, actually, by you saying that, taking a step back, literally taking a step back is is that what you saw? Yeah, literally, no, yeah. I wasn't talking about yeah, literally, I was talking about yeah, literally, 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 by taking a step back and looking is another big major thing and another tip that I always say to everybody because the thing is, when you're working so close to something, you can almost get lost in the pattern, lost in the brows. But as I say, by literally taking a step back, looking at your client, whether it, if, if sometimes if it's halfway through the procedure, um, by just checking them, sometimes it helps if you sit your client up. Yeah. Again, I mean, obviously, if it means you're sitting your client up, maybe once in the middle of the procedure and once at the end, and it's a bit maybe inconvenient for them to do that, but at the end of the day, it's going to mean that you're going to be achieving and they an amazing will, they result. They've got beautiful brows. If you say, I'm about halfway through, I'm just going to sit you up at this point just to check we're on the right track. There is not a single client that is going to say, do you know what, I'd rather lay down and get it wrong. <laughs> so, you know, you can sit them up, you can have a look. Um, and even if there's something that you want to adjust, you don't have to tell them that you're going to adjust something. You can sit them up and say, yes, that's great. We look like we're on the right track lay back down and then if there's something to adjust then you do that that's just between you and your tools your client doesn't need to be in on that but it's it's yeah it's a it's a good one to mm -hmm. sit them up halfway through always sit them up have a look and as i say take a step back We're giving away all their trade secrets here, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's what we're supposed to be doing so it's all right that's what they're here for and as i say it's, i think more than anything it's not necessarily sometimes that people don't think about doing it sometimes people are worried about doing it just don't be worried about it. But a lot of the time I think it does come down to just not thinking about it. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with stopping, taking that literal step back, um, you know, or if you get flustered in the middle of a, a, a treatment, if you're, if you're feeling that you've lost something, that something's missing, um, you know, put your tools down, give your shoulders a stretch, give your hands up. a shake, you know, your clients are, are laid there nice and happy. Um, take a couple of moments before you move on and plan what you're going to do. I think as well, coming into that as well, I think timing. I think sometimes a lot of people are thinking about, right, I've got X amount of hours in a day, I can fit X amount of clients in at that time and try to shorten the amount of time they're going to be with their client and work their client. Mm -hmm. Especially as a beginner, I would say give yourself an, a lot, a long amount of time. I'm not saying four hours. <laughs> but I'm saying a lot of people are quite worried about obviously timing. So yeah. obviously this is an invasive procedure. And because it's an invasive procedure, it does take a lot of thought. I mean, even the pre-draw obviously takes a lot of thought. Your first pass is going to take a lot of thought. Yeah, while you're working, yeah. you may have to decide where to put another stroke. Again, take your time. Yeah, especially when you're first starting out. I don't think it should be, as you said, it shouldn't be a race. No. It shouldn't be a race for it. Okay, so 
As I said, this is going to be a combination treatment. So we've done the first and second parts. Now here we're going to be using our device and we're going to be shading in between those strokes. So let's talk a little bit about the combination. I love a combination brow. What are the benefits of a combination brow? Well, as you saw with the lady uh, the previous that we were um, working on, she already had some brow hair. And the brow hair there, there was, there was enough brow hair but she needed just to, to have a little bit more of a perfection of shape um, to be able to obviously enhance her facial features. Now, we could have just gone through and done microblading. Yeah. Again, not a problem. But this thing I think sometimes we find, especially if someone's got almost like a little bit of a coarser hair, not necessarily very fine hair, sometimes you find just microblading, when it heals, it can heal and you can see where the microblading is and you can see where the hair is. Mm -hmm. By doing a combination, combination will add the density that the microbladed hair strokes alone can't necessarily create. Yes. Agree? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I have a, when I first started, and I think this is also for, for some people a gap in their consultation about trying to work out what the client actually wants and what their motivation for having the, the treatment done in the first place is. If your client is coming into you and they're saying, I wear brow pencil or powder every single day, or the reason that I want this done is because this little gap here drives me mad and I'm always filling it in with pencil, um, but they still want something super, super natural, then a combination ticks all of those boxes. Yes, most definitely, most definitely. It's the softness and the featheriness of hair strokes with that real richer, if you want to, either soft or a richer depth through mm -hmm. the middle. Yeah, and again, it depends obviously on your client. I have a lot of clients that come in that are like, I just want microblading. I don't want anything else, I just want microblading. But you can see that the by doing the combination, it would benefit them so much more. And then we try to talk them into it, and they're like, no, nope, no, nope, just want microblading. Okay, we do the microblading, they go away, but they come back for their top up, which is what we can we can discuss actually top ups a little mm -hmm. bit later on. They come for the top up. It does need a little bit more, doesn't it? Yes. And again, does. that's fine. That's no, fine. We can do that. But then we can always add. Adding is <laughs> adding is super easy. Okay. Another big tip. We can always add. We can never take away. No. Well, we can. Well, we can. It's a lot more complicated. <laughs> it's a lot more complicated. Go easy. Plan so, to add rather than planning for taking away. Because <laughs> it's much easier. Much much easier. But you can see here what we're actually doing is we're not doing a technique as in we're not trying to completely cover up all those strokes. Because again, what's the point in doing all these beautiful microbladed hair strokes and then just colouring it over like an ombre? That's not what we're trying to intend to do. The powder's working in between, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, the powder is working in between. So it's almost just like a little shade, a little background colour to really make them brows pop, um, rather than having so much of like that skin colour in between and it looking a little bit gappy. It's like a wash or a shadow mm. behind, isn't it? Yeah, and light enough to be able to, for you to be able to see the microblade strokes. Because again, what's the point of doing all those beautiful strokes if you're if you're not going to be obviously be able to visually see no. them. If the strokes are swamped, you may as well have just done a powder style. Exactly. But by doing this style, what you're going to be doing is creating, as I say, just a fluffier brow. Fluffier brow with the density behind it. Mm -hmm. um, again, you want to work quite superficially. You want to work, you want to work lightly. Um, you don't want to obviously, when working with your device, you only want to be using just the tip of that needle. Yeah, I think that's sometimes a profile that people tend to do is they seem, seem to feel like they use the device in the same way as they use a the microblade mm -hmm. um, and we need to remember your microblade um, is a manual method of permanent makeup your device is sort of doing the work for it you is. and you're guiding it we're really just using the very yeah. tip of the needle to dance on the skin as soon as you feel vibration you're where you're, you need to be you're where you need to be yeah we're not looking at it's not like an injection <laughs> Yeah, the machine is vibrating, the, the needle is going into the skin, and it's that that's sort of carrying the implementation of the pigment. I find these combo um, styles are quite nice for people that have like combination skins mm -hmm. as well. So someone where maybe I'm not quite so sure whether microblading is going to be the best choice for them. It's a little bit of a halfway house. Yeah. 
Um, it's it's a chance to see how their skin is going to heal because although oily skins aren't the best candidates for microblading, yeah. I'm sure you'll agree with me. I've got some clients that I have done with oily skins that have healed absolutely, absolutely. beautifully. Um, again, it is a complex thing. So if you have a, a delicate method like microblading and an oily skin, which is a more complex skin, you're complicating. Uh, you know, it's more likely to be a complex outcome. With the addition of powder um, for a combination style, um, it means that even if your strokes don't hold as well as you want them to, the client still has something there. Um, and it's it's a really nice foundation then for you to go back in and either attempt some strokes mm -hmm. again or to give them the confidence of maybe having what they might consider to be a heavier style, even though we know that the when powder and mm -hmm. ombre doesn't need to be heavy. No, it's um, So it's a good way to ease clients in um, to the style maybe that is suitable mm -hmm. best for them. Um, and, you know, hopefully they, hopefully they'll heal beautifully as a combination, but if they don't, it gives you a, a really good place yeah. to add from. Yeah. I mean, I think a combo does suit a majority of people, to be honest, people with you. forget about the combo. People brand. do forget about the combo. Yes, as I say, and everything is brilliant. It's amazing or looks amazing in their own right. The microblade can look amazing on its own. An ombre can look amazing on its own. But the combination of the two together, yeah, um, really beautiful, really fine, really modern. Beautiful. It is one of my favourite. Yeah, one of my absolutely. most favourite to actually do um, because, as I say, it gives you the density, it gives you the fluffiness. You've still got a definition of shape as well, which I think it gives you more of a definition of shape. Sorry, just letting someone else in. <laughs> um, yeah, it gives you more of a definition of shape as well because you've got that, that look. I mean, some people do come in for microblading, but yet they sometimes go away and want to still put a bit of powder in. I think microblading has become the universal term for permanent makeup. Yeah. Um, it's something that a lot of clients will ask for, but they don't necessarily know what 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 that means what it looks like or the other um, thing is what microblading machine do you use yes <laughs> um i have, i have <laughs> lots of reviews on my google page that says that they've had wonderful microblading done and i've not put <laughs> microblade anywhere near them um so i think from a client's perspective we might know what the different techniques are how they look how they work how they're mm -hmm. done um, but a client won't necessarily know. Um, I have a brow menu, actually, which okay. is like a uh, like a flow chart, which goes through the different um, skin types, the different nice. looks that they might like, and it explains the difference between um, a, a hair stroke brow, a powder brow, and the combination of the nice. two. Nice. Um, and I actually send that out to my clients before they even get to me. That's and nice. as coming back again to part of the consultation, you know, what, do you know what yeah. style you're looking for? Do you know? And they'll, often they'll say yes, sometimes they'll say no. Most of the time they'll say, well, I'm here for you to guide yeah. me. And those ones are the best ones. They were the best ones, you can, yeah. You can really then get down to the nitty gritty of what's going to suit their skin, their goals and everything. Um, but, but yeah, I'll send you my brow menu. I want to see mm. this. I mean, that sort of brings me sort of to also how do you not market your sort of brow treatments because I know some people say hey well we do microblading we do powder brow we do combination we charge more for this one we charge more for this one I mean us here at um, head office here we just do a universal um brow treatment yeah so same. it's a PMU brow treatment when my clients so, book in they book in for brows right. they do for brows <laughs> they don't book in for microblading they just they don't book in for brows brow, right? yeah and when they come in, that's when you decide, obviously, the best option for them. Because at the end of the day, you're the professional, we're the professionals. So we would know what would be best for our clients. Um, we don't sort of set it up as a separate menu for that reason. Because, yes, you could do microblading on someone and that's what you could have charged with. But you would have thought, hey, an ombre might have been a bit better for her skin type. I am, um, there's, again, there's no right or wrong, but um, I always, I used to have them separately. Mm -hmm. and one of the reasons that I had them separately was because it used to take me, and it still does take me a little bit longer to do a powder or an ombre style. Yeah. Um, so I would have a slightly longer time frame booked out um, and I would charge slightly more. But I think what happened then is that a lot of clients would think, oh, she's just recommending a powder style to me. So that's one that costs more. <laughs> 
Um, so actually having them, what I, what I did is I brought my powder brow um, price down slightly and took my microblading price slightly up and now they're the same. Yeah. Um, and I can then genuinely say to my clients, I want to choose the style which is best for you rather than the style that suits my time frame or my mm. pocket. Um, and, and that's a really nice confidence gift yeah. as well. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, I mean, obviously, that's not possible with absolutely everybody. No. You may not, obviously, do every single style. It depends style. on your competitors' work as well. Yeah. You know, your clientele in your town might might have a... If everyone in your town is pricing it in a similar way, you want something which your clients are going to understand. Yeah. Look at that brow coming together beautifully behind us. What a clever we'll, we'll just sit here and chat down time. <laughs> I could just sit here and watch this video again and again. I think I've watched it about four or five times in the last couple of weeks. But as you can see here, we've kept the ruler on throughout the procedure. Keeping the ruler on throughout the procedure will enable you to make sure that we haven't uh, veered off from that pre-draw. Um, she says as she takes it off. They're nice and super sticky, so they won't move, so don't worry about that. Sticky. And I tend to always love this little mark it leaves on the top of the head. <laughs> a little tip for your rulers, if they are, if you're finding that they're getting sticky here, and sometimes the they can get sticky on the hairline, um, if you have on your tray something like some water wipes, um, or even a little bit of anaesthetic or something, just wet, just wet the ends slightly mm -hmm. where you don't want them to stick. Um, and then that will stop them adhering into the hairline. Or when you peel back, um, just put a little a little bit of the paper on the ends, um, a bit like you would if you were folding over the yeah. silver tape. Or if you're not used it, sometimes I tend to fold the, the end in mm -hmm. slightly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. rather than using the paper. Yeah. So here we're just obviously just tidying up slightly any hairs that we're going to, that we don't necessarily need um, anymore. We're not shaving the brow off. All it it is, does is always it? feel to the client that you're shaving yes. their whole brow off, so it is worthwhile telling them that you're not. Normally it's getting rid of those fluffies, mm -hmm. which I would like to call a fluffy. Uh, by getting rid of the fluffies, it gives you a nice neat to line, and more than anything, look great in your pictures. Yeah. Yeah. But we, look, and we don't want to pluck at this point. If we if we were plucking using a tweezer, a tweezer is going to get contaminated. Um, you know, these disposable razors are great. Mm -hmm. They're going to really give that nice defined finish for uh, a brilliant photo you know i always say to my clients before i start taking the thousand pictures <laughs> of them afterwards is i say i'm going to let you look in a minute but you get to take these eyebrows home and all that i get is the it's pictures picture. <laughs> so please excuse me while i while i take a million pictures of you um but having a little having a little clean up of the skin with a brow razor um, before you finish is, is a good idea. Um, I think we were going to talk about this on one of the next slides, but I would like to actually do this before I start. The depending on, what, depending the, on the brow shape. Yeah, what, so the, the shaving? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, yeah, it depends on the brow shape, it depends on yourself. We, yes, we are going to discuss this in a bit as well. Depends on the brow shape, depends on how much hair is there. Mm -hmm. I think more than anything. Yes. Um, and also, how versatile you are with your microblading mm -hmm. or how well you are working as well. But just having a look, let's just admire that brow just for a little bit longer. Really and you nice. can see you've still got the beautiful hair strokes. You've still got that depth of colour in between those hair strokes, um, creating that density. Yes, as we all well know, it looks a little dark, but what happens? Yeah, the skin's gonna the skin's gonna um, a lot create a filter over that over that colour yeah. that heals. Uh, some of that some of that colour's going to be um, you know exfoliated, removed from the skin mm -hmm. as it regenerates. So here we've just used the concealer. This little guy here. Okay. Now the concealer does come in two colours, medium and a light. And what this is going to do, this is just going to get rid of any of that sometimes unwanted redness, shall we say, around the edge of the eyebrow. Not only for the clients, obviously, for when they leave. Um, so it just it looks a little bit um, neater, but also for you as an individual for when you take pictures. So we just pop a little bit on there and we're just spreading it out with a sponge applicator. We're not applying any of this product to the actual um, brow strokes or any of the skin that's been opened. However, again, this is completely skin safe. As, as the pre-draw pencils are, they are all completely skin safe. So if a little bit does go over a stroke, it's nothing to worry about so much. The skin's not going to accept it. Okay. And then again, just tighten up. But you can see, obviously, how nice this looks. Obviously, getting rid of the redness, 
taking it down slightly and also gives you that nice crisp line um, from the skin and the actual brow. And it actually has a highlight over the other end. So you've got highlighter, you, highlighter and concealer. That's one of the favourite things in my makeup bag. It is. <laughs> I use it somewhere as well. But again, we'll go through all of these bits a bit later on as well. But it just gives you that nice final finishing touch. It gives you that um, that Photoshop look without using Photoshop. Because that's um, another discussion. How many photos do you total, see? It's a total. It's a total another discussion. You know, over photoshopped, overworked photos are mm. are, are not good. Um, this just is a way of just prettying up the brows a little bit, but without giving that blurred out photoshopped feel. And we're not touching the work. Um, you know, you're not yeah. touching the work at all. The work is still there to speak for itself. Um, but we're just making, you know, we everybody likes to look at pictures. A little bit more pleasing to the eye. Absolutely. And if you're thinking about your social media, you're thinking about your pictures, as I say, a lot of people out there do use very, very photoshopped pictures. Mm -hmm. So, and sometimes I think, well, if it's photoshopped that much, sometimes what else is photoshopped? Yeah. So, obviously, by creating that photoshop look, just look at how beautiful they look. Using that that look without having to Photoshop the picture just gives you an amazing finish. Pretty, very pretty. Just admire them for a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> really, you forget the eyes. <laughs> just looking at eyebrows. All these years in, I'm still addicted. But to how great eyebrows. does that combo look on her? How great? I mean, obviously, you've got the fine strokes. You've got the density of the colour. So it's just a great, um, a great treatment to just bring everything together, bring the brows together. We'd love together. to know if you do combination styles. Yeah, um, who does combo? Who just does my combo? In the chat, does anyone who loves the combination brow? Um, it's one of my favourites. Sorry, guys, we, we were just carrying on talking, but we want you to join in as much as well. <laughs> oh, there's one. Ah, oh, me. <laughs> We've got one. Angie does. Angie does. Angie does. Anyone else does combo? Anyone else does uh, microblading? Anyone interested in doing combo? And how we actually com combine the brows together? It is a beautiful technique. It mm -hmm. is. Okay. So I think we're going to do a recap. Shall we move on? Have Any questions of anything that you've um, seen so far, please feel free to put them in the chat. We are going to do a little recap. And at the end, we're going to do a little Q&A. Okay, so please don't be worried about obviously putting in your questions. So. Oh, wonderful. Beverly's saying that she's, she's got her own combo brows herself and she is learning microblading and is booked in for the machine brow course. That's great. Oh. The, the, the two together, great skills to have, great skills to combine. Of course. And I say, it's, it's just, just gives you Gives you more of a treatment menu, I think, mm. by doing the combo, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's the same. They're all great on their own, the treatments, the microblade and the powder brow are great on their own. The nice thing as well about machine is you're then able to be in a really good position to then transition into doing lips and doing um, lips and doing liner as well at yeah. some point if you wanted to. So. Yeah, that's that's a great thing. Because once, obviously, you've got, you've got your hand and you're used to working with your hand with your machine, obviously, as you say, mm. it's a little bit easier to transition. It is. Yeah, it is indeed. So we've already talked about, we've introduced these guys to you already. Um, but yeah, these are these are our kind of our numbing twins, aren't they? Zenza, <laughs> feel better now. Um, Zenza is, is, as we mentioned, Zenza is so nice to use as a primary anaesthetic because it doesn't change the, the texture of the skin. 20 minutes either yeah. under clean film or not under clean film is usually plenty yeah um so it's fast you know um really quick doesn't change the texture of the skin um the base that it's in i know that zenza have done an awful lot of work on the base that that line the thing is carried in yeah this way. is this is the thing a lot of the times with anesthetic it's not about how much lidocaine tetracaine you've got in it it's how it's transmitted and yes. that's the thing um, Zenza doesn't have a lot of barriers. In fact, in fact, there's a lot of water in Zenza. Yes. Um, which helps, obviously, it to transmit easily into the skin. And obviously, what you're trying to do is obviously block off those nerve receptors for a certain amount of time. So you can have a 10% lidocaine. But if it's not transmitted, but it's, it's actually not in the area. But it's effective, no. 
as something like this that's that's in a good character um, ca carrier. <laughs> it's one for the bloopers again. In a good <laughs> carrier, <laughs> um, and that is formulated for that that mm. ease. It is the way it's known. transmitted. Yeah, um, that's it. And you know the base. The base is is non irritating. Yep. Um, it's, it's easy not, to apply. There's not too many um, ingredients in it, and there I are. think that's a major thing. When you start mixing too many ingredients together, in actual fact, sometimes it can have the opposite effect, which is the great thing with Zenza. It's just obviously your your lidocaine base. Yeah. Um, it's five percent as well, so it's one of the strongest that you can use legally without being medically. I was changed. just going to mention that that in the UK it is it is a, a strength that is mm. okay. It's okay for us to use as long as you've got local anaesthetic application in your um, in your in insurance, training. In your, in your training. training and that your local authority allows you to use it, then Zenza is, is absolutely fine. Um, also great for lips, um, really love Zenza on lips. Also pH safe for eyes. So you can use it if you're a PMU artist that does the full range of treatments, yeah. Zenza can be used on any of those areas with that same ease of application. Yeah. Um, it can also be used on um, broken skin. So while something like the Feel Better Now is, is gonna be um, better because um, of the reasons that, well not better, but different because of the reasons that Kelly mentioned because of the epinephrine. If you're doing something like removal where you don't want epinephrine yep. um, or you have someone who reacts to epinephrine, then Zenza is, Zenza is your guy. Mm -hmm. Perfect. We have got a couple of questions coming through. Um, I just want to do the rest of the goodness. Yep, um, yeah, don't worry. Um, yep, yeah, this is all be recorded and will be sent out back to you um, for you guys to all have a have a look through and watch again to see our lovely faces once again. <laughs> so um, we are going to talk a little bit about depth. Um, do we want to answer that? Yes, question, Danielle, now? or should we? We can. We we will definitely be answering in that, Danielle. If you're sticking around, um, we'll be coming on to that any time. So Danielle is asking for the recording, Danielle, because they won't be able to see the chat. Danielle is asking, how do you practice the correct depth? So we're going to come back and we'll we'll visit that. No yeah. problem. Okay. So yeah. So they're the two numbing agents that are sort of. Our lifesavers, one for obviously pre-numbing, one obviously for your secondary numbing. Now another thing I would say when using your feel better, use it when needed. Yeah, you don't have to always use it. Yeah, and you don't need a lot. No, you just need a tiny little bit. In actual fact, I think there's like, I think there's like 30 mils in here. Um, and you probably need... Oh, one of those lasts me forever. Yeah, I mean, I mean a minimum of 30 applications, I reckon you get out of there. Oh, minimum. 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 Depends how liberal you are with it. But um, I would generally say to use it, only when your client is either, if your client is in a little bit of uncomfortableness, should we say, in the nice way. I kind of or... use like a half a pea size amount. Yeah. You know, the dental trays that you get, they sometimes got the little divots yeah. in them and there's ones which are slightly bigger and ones which are slightly smaller. The tiny the one, tiny one, that mm -hmm. with a little drop, um, I'm always putting too much actually and thinking, yeah. oh, it's too much because I know I'm not going to need that. You don't need, you don't need a lot. It goes a long way. The other thing I will say, use sparingly, and the reason for this being is obviously there's only so much or your so much liquid your skin can actually mm -hmm. take. So what you want to be doing is when you're opening up the ancient sort of little incisions, shall we say, you want to be filling that with as much pigment as you can to get the best retention. If we start putting too much of this in. You're then it's diluting. you're diluting the pigment so you're not going to get as great retention. However, I generally use it on a normal average client twice. Yeah. After the first pass, after the second pass, and generally that's it. Yeah. But then that's, it's, again, it's it, your own personal preference. It works so it well works. that you actually don't really even need to. I think that for those people that are used to using anaesthetic, um, sort of topical anaesthetics, there can be this panic. Is my client going to be uncomfortable? At yeah. what point are they going to start feeling it? Um, a, a couple of drops of this guy, um, and as you say, maybe applied once, maybe twice, yeah. depending depending on how long. Or the only other time would be if they're, as I say, if you have a little bit of a bleeder. Really bleed. Yeah, if you have someone that really bleeds. Um, as I said, when we say really bleeds, guys, we're not meaning like blood pouring down their face. No. <laughs> because obviously, in that case, we're, we're definitely well too far down in the skin. Someone, someone that's obviously just got more spotting of blood coming through um, because, as we said earlier, the retention is not going to be as amazing um, if your client's bleeding a little bit more because it's just going to push that pigment out. Mm -hmm. um, so by using this, as I say, could strip their blood capillaries 
and try and um, stem the bleeding. So those are our loving heroes. Yes, yeah, they're our little loving heroes. Okay, what are we talking about next? So we've already said about the mapping. So your mapping essentials, Alice. What are your mapping essentials? Well, they're behind me. <laughs> <laughs> That's handy, isn't it? Um, I definitely, I definitely couldn't map without thread. I definitely couldn't map without thread. Well, the whole procedure. Pencil, as we were the saying, whole procedure. The whole procedure. Um, you the know, whole I have my, my, little, my little darker pencils. I generally like to use a darker shade and run my thread mm -hmm. through. Or I'll do what we saw in the video. Yeah. So we'll either use the Invol, which is the, the white mm -hmm. pigment, or if you like to be really fancy, I do like the Julianne. I just like you the colour. The Julianne for mapping. Um, the Julianne this... can be doubled up as well, isn't it? It's doubled up not only for your mapping, but it can also be doubled up as obviously your corrector as well. Yes, that's right. So um, I think there's a lot of videos on the everlasting pages and things where where this is being used. So again, tools with lots of purposes. Um, but sorry, just. Sorry to no, no. Right. <laughs> but the reason that we're not going to be mapping, say, or I personally don't like to map with a brown, is because it distinguishes between your mapping lines and your drawing lines. Mm -hmm. So I tend to personally map with obviously either your Julianne or your Imbol, um, and then use like a brown pencil to go around. To go around and so yeah, awesome. and just obviously you just want sort of a thinner, thin line, just a nice neat line for you to fit to enable your client to see. Oopsie. To enable your client to see the um, it brown shape. It distinguishes the shape yeah. you're drawing from your yeah. mark. Because otherwise they'll see if it's all the same colour, you'll have the mapping lines and then the brown 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 lines. And then the client, when they look, they're a bit like, hmm, what's going on there? Mm -hmm. Obviously they say that a lot when they see the orange anyway. Yeah. But, <laughs> um, yeah, distinguishes between the mapping lines and your brow drawings. Um, the tape is a must have for me. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a must have. It's, you know, mapping must haves and my and my little razor. Yeah, little razor. And I think we're going to talk yeah. in a bit about we get how we that, use those and, and and what we do. Yeah. So they are your must haves. Now the only other thing that's not on here, which I wouldn't necessarily say would be a must have, but another little tip for you all: <laughs> micro brushes. Yes. Now. Micro brushes again um, are the tiny little brushes with the little sponge at the end. We saw Monica using them in the video mm -hmm. for applying anaesthetic yeah. and also at the end for um, applying the, the smaller concealer. ones. Yeah, the smaller ones. Oh, the micro, micro, micro brushes. brushes. Okay. Yes. I tend to use these to tidy up my um, brow design. Mm -hmm. um, also, another little tip if you put a little bit of that in a tiny little bit of your anaesthetic gel, it cleans the line beautifully. Yeah. Um, rather than trying to get a wipe out and put your finger in the wipe and clean round as we've all tried to do, or use a bit of water, or use a prep wipe or yeah. a water wipe. By just using a tiny little bit of that anaesthetic gel on, yeah. a, on a micro brush. Turns just, it into a little white little yeah. wet paint brush little to clean wet, up yeah. with. To just to clean up with. So just another little little tip there for you. Okay, what else have we got here? So, as we were just discussing, do we shape before or after? Well, we're going to pre-draw to start with. Yeah, right. we are going to pre-draw. Now, I would not suggest, or um, your feelings, I think, are the same on this, by threading, plucking, waxing right away before that treatment. The skin's gonna, it's gonna make the skin very sensitive. It is, yeah. Yeah. We're gonna be wiping that skin. We're yeah. gonna be putting pigment. You know, pigment's designed to go into the skin, but we're gonna, we don't want to sensitize the area that we're working oh. on, right? Plus you're gonna have lots of open hair follicles. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be putting the pigment obviously anywhere near them. I mean, very high, very low chance we'll receive them ending up yeah. with dots, so but it's still, a possibility. Yeah. It can still happen. So generally what I tend to do, or what we, we both said that we tend to do, is we tend to map first, or map, I tend to map first, then I go round with one of the brow shaders. I like that these are so sharp. I'm use, I don't know if you've ever used other kinds, but yes, these are so sharp. And um, stiff, because you had the ones that used to have the, uh, used before with the bendy head. Yes, yeah. yeah. So, but these ones in particular, they're nice and sharp, they're nice and sturdy. Um, and obviously they do need to be used very, very carefully mm -hmm. as well. Um, again, when we're using these, you need to make sure you're stretching the skin. Yeah. Almost as if you were stretching the skin for a while. You're supporting the skin, yeah. right? Because otherwise, like with anything, you don't want to be, obviously there's nothing on this, you don't want to be pushing the skin along because 
in which case you'll end up making some interesting little incisions that you don't need to. So we're, we're going to shape the brow so that we can see that beautiful work afterwards. Yeah. Uh, like, like you saw yeah. the tidying up. But um, as you mentioned, it depends on how much hair someone's got. Yeah, someone might so, come in that's have got completely overgrown eyebrows. That yeah. haven't, haven't touched them for, yeah. say, four weeks because they're like, hey, I'm getting a microphone. So if you draw your, your pre-draw through that yeah. and then you ask your lady to sit up and look in the mirror and see what she thinks of the design, it's really confusing for the eye yeah. to see. But it's also really confusing for you as an artist, That's right? Because you say. can't then yeah. see where your lines, where your strokes or where your work is supposed to start, where it's supposed to finish. Um, what you can always do if you're thinking about taking away um, brow hair, and this happens a lot with that kind of hook-style brow that you get where you might have lots of kind of heavy um be heavy yeah. work through the front um and you know you've got to kind of cut the bottom of that hook off to give a nice shape again coming back to one of our other tools you can actually put concealer over that before uh -huh. you take the hair away nice. so use this to give that visual um you can then ask the client for permission to remove that and it's it's again less scary you're making your life easier for yourself you're not just taking away the hair and then saying oh you like that sorry about that um these are single use, aren't they? Yes, of um, course. My clients get really excited about getting given these. I was so. going to say that. I was going to say the next thing is you can give them to your client. Yeah, these go in my aftercare pack. Yeah. Um, and I'll say to them, I'm going to use a little brow razor just to clean up your brows. <laughs> um, and don't worry, it's going to feel like I'm taking off your whole eyebrow, but we're just giving them a nice groom and I'm going to give it to you as part of your aftercare. And they always go, ooh, brow razors, what are they? I said, yeah, who knew they even existed? <laughs> Um, but yeah, they get very excited about uh, about getting these in their aftercare. See, they love a present. I know. They love a present. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's what we tend to do. I mean, just say, or you can tidy up if there's any fluffies at the end. Yeah. You might find there might be the odd one or two hair right at the end. You just use your razor again. And I mean, I know way. you're a competent threader. I'm a competent threader. Yeah. My preference probably still is to use a brown mm. razor over threading. Yeah. It's a tool that I've already got out. Usually it's already on my, you know, it's already there. It's already on my tray just in yeah. case. Um, I know that some people thread with their mouth. I don't know how I feel about that on a new, no. on a newly done no. brow or just yeah. before. Um, so for me, the, bra the, 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 the brow razor is the, I need to say brazer then. <laughs> We're bringing the brazer out and soon. another little thing I will say, sometimes if you're know, talking about someone that's got a very overgrown brow, yeah, because someone's got a very overgrown brow mm -hmm. and you get this client in for their consultation and they've got a very overgrown brow. Why not in that consultation, say it's a week before, shape the brows there and then. Absolutely. And then obviously in which case you will have no problems. Yeah. Because you may have a client that comes in and says, hey, I'm not quite sure what I want. Um, can you do the pre-draw first? Do the pre-draw. Then you could sort of either thread or wax or tweezer that week before and then they're why, prepped and ready for I think you. that's why a lot of us combine those traditional brow services with PNU as well. Mm -hmm. And it's a gateway for getting clients in too. So they're already coming to see you for brow wax and tin or yeah. that's on your menu. Um, it's a great time to have that conversation about having next steps and really great, you know, yeah, come in for a consultation. Um, yeah, come in for a consultation. I'll do a free brow wax or a half price brow wax and, and groom and tint or whatever you want to include in the service. Um, use that as part of your preparation that's great of course yeah yeah of course um just got a little question come through um Marilla, please could you make a webinar for soft brow powder micropigmentation um that's a possibility yeah absolutely. we could look at that i mean obviously give us all your suggestions ladies um i mean we as find you this probably noticed kelly and i love talking so anything <laughs> that you would like us to talk about you are more welcome and we we'll get we'll just sit here and get together and we'll do another one let's we'll just do this so for the catch up um, on the tea everlasting are such a passionate brand about um education in the industry um great ethical products literally if you have something that you would like us to cover send us a direct message pop it in the chat and we'll we will consider all of the um all of the the topics so um, I think Mirella is saying um, that you could see a registration, but you couldn't see it. If you're in here, then you're already registered. So don't worry. Yeah, have the details. you've already registered. Okay, so another thing. Now, I think a lot of my students generally hate me when I'm talking about your reusables and your disposables. Oh, I just bang that blood-borne pathogen drug well, all the time, don't you? I just go <laughs> on and on and on and on. Cross-contamination is something that we need to avoid 
like a barge pub with, with, within obviously the permit maker industry. So we do have some disposables, we do have some reusables. But another thing, I tend to keep my reusables and my disposables completely separate. You should always have, if you can, a disposable um, and a reusable tray or trolley. If you've got two trolleys, even better, because there's no chance of any contamination. So I trained here with Monica all oh, a long time ago now. And now, and even when I'm training other people, and even when I still do my work, I have her ringing in my ear. <laughs> And she said at my training, come in, Monica, are you here? <laughs> um, she said, if I see your pigments on a dirty oh, yeah. tray, no, no, I no. am going to put them in the bin. And I thought, oh, I'm not going to put my pigments on my tray. And that was what started the blood ball packages conversations. I... And that stuck with me. And it's the same way that I teach. I never have any of my, um, any of my reusable um, I will also be witness to this because it's happened. <laughs> <laughs> not to <laughs> me. <laughs> not, not, to, not to Alice, not to Alice, me and Monica. Um, when we, we used to teach together in larger groups um, in our old premises. And yeah, it happened. We had students talking about just picking up pigments with contaminated gloves. Monica just went over to the bin, opened the bin. So it's really important. Yeah. You, know. you don't want to, whenever your client's skin is open, your hands are then contaminated with any of their fluids, and whether it's lymph, whether it may be a bit of blood, but it's a fluid that's come out of their, bo their body. And um, we're opening ourselves up to that as artists. It's yeah. not just about the safety for them, it's also about our safety. You know, if you have a, a bottle of numbing or a bottle of pigment that you're using multiple times a week, a day or a month, and you're touching these sometimes with gloves, sometimes not with gloves, um, get yourself into a really good habit of being fastidious about your reusables and your non-reusables and your disposables and your reusables. Um, it's a habit that will see you well if you get into a good habit with it. Um, and it's, it's easy to do. Separate yeah. areas, That's nothing what I'm saying. in tray. Two, tr two plastic trays that are separate, two trolleys, two levels of trolley as well is another good thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's always good to get in that practice because as well, obviously, you're not only protecting yourself, but you're protecting your next client that comes through. So what would we use disposables and non-disposables? So everything here to my side would be, I'm, I'm a disposable. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't take any offense, Kelly. It happened by accident. Okay, so anything on this side would be a disposable. So therefore it would be your brow pencil. Now, don't take this as a brow pencil that you're using to do your pre-draw with and then throw in the bin. Present for your client, don't forget that. They're a tiny little pencil, your client can reuse this at home. Again, these are skin safe. And they come in multiple packs for that yeah. reason, right? Yeah. They're, but, they're yeah. inexpensive to use and then give away. And then give away, yeah, yeah that's exactly But if you're thing. choosing not to give them away, then don't put them on your tray and don't use them once the skin is no. broken. Yeah, once the skin is broken and you're using this. Again, the other thing, sorry, the other thing as well, like, because they're skin safe, mid-treatment, again, if you feel like you've lost your way, if you feel like you've lost your way mid-treatment, you can then, Obviously, you can't reuse it or give you have to give it to your client at the end, but you can pick up your pencil yeah. and pre-draw again if you lose your way. This is the best thing with these pencils. Obviously, there are these other ones that maybe are not, uh, that can be reusable if you want to reuse it again, but then obviously you can't then use it during yeah. your procedure. And then once finished, give it along to your client. And then as I say, because they are skin safe, if say, a week down the line or two weeks down the line, you know when we go to that healing part where sometimes parts of the brow look like they've disappeared, mm -hmm. you can then use this pencil on the brow. Something for the giddy, giddy bag, goodie bag. So now all of a sudden your client's got a pencil and a razor. And a razor. <laughs> and a razor. Okay, okay. well, we get to talk about? about the majestic tool. Okay. This tool changed my life. <laughs> <laughs> we I was did. hoping we did. <laughs> we did. When I first trained with Everlasting, we had the stainless steel um, mm -hmm. micro base, which either needed to be used and thrown away, which were quite expensive, or I was actually in a very lucky position that I had an autoclave. Um, so for those of, those, those of you who don't know, an autoclave is a device which medically sterilizes um, equipment. However, 
Your equipment still got to be washed before it goes in there. Your autoclave needs to be checked that it works, and they're expensive. They're very expensive. It says it's to run. Very, very expensive. I don't so think what they'd be now nowadays. Very <laughs> expensive. Um, and they're not. They're not. Um, they're not foolproof. No, they're not foolproof. Um, and so I loved it when Everlasting brought brought these guys out. Um, this is the Majestic tool. They are a sterilised um, hand tool which unscrews. And you can put any blade in here. Now I use, I, I love and I use the Everlasting blades, but you can put any brand of blade in here. You can set your angle. Yeah. So there are some really nice blades out there which are, are great, but the angle are already set. Whereas with these, you can you can pop in a round shader tool, you can pop in a U blade, you can change. You use it through. Like um, you yeah. do, and then once it's once it's finished, that whole thing with your um, with your blade just goes straight into your waist. Um, and economically wise, this actually works out much better mm -hmm. than having to run an autoclave. Of course. Yeah. Much, much better. Um, they're so light. They're so light. Um, and they're, they, um, they, they feel so nice to hold. Yeah, they're like soft to touch, I suppose. So My so, work yeah. definitely improved with yeah. this tool. Mm -hmm. um, and anytime I have to use something else, I really don't like it. <laughs> so if you've not tried these before, um, if you're, you know, if you're using another tool where they're sort of stuck together, or you're using a different kind of um, handle, um, give these a try. They're, they're 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 really good. Definitely, definitely worth it. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely worth it. I mean, on top of that, what we've already said, or we've already discussed, we like our juicy pads. As I say, single use only, of course. Um, to cleanse the eyebrow area, to cleanse around the eye area, making sure obviously we're cleansing the skin and to make sure that um, the skin is obviously completely free of any bacteria. And as we said, uh, obviously discussed about um, dehydrating the skin slightly. You can even just have that in your hand instead of a cotton yeah. round to clean your you blood. Yeah. You know, Again, you can always use have so many different uses that you can that you can use. Use them to sanitise your hands, mm -hmm. sanitise your phone, sanitise yourself. Well, not yourself, but your hands and that. Okay, but again, single use only. It's come in separate packets. As also, um, and then you, obviously you have our pigment rings as well. And our pigment rings with them again, they're single use only. Um, and with them, they come in boxes of fifty. Um, again, say so with a pigment ring, especially with the microblading, I prefer to have the pigment ring on my finger yeah. to go back and forth to my client rather than working from another trolley or another tray mm -hmm. again to keep on reaching over because wherever you move around your client, as she says as she's moving, wherever you move with your client, yes, that yes. pigment, that pigment and your tool goes with you. If your pigment's sort of on your trolley, it's a bit like you're having to reach over mm -hmm. constantly. So disposables, oh, on top of that, we forgot this little guy at the top. Uh, my favourite tool, which we've spoken about a lot, <laughs> is our brow groomer. Again, single use only, we're not going to be using this and then using it on someone else. It's single use and keep it on throughout the procedure. Honestly, if you don't already use these, this will change your life. So, disposables. Now, so reusable products. Now, reusable products are things like your Zenza. Now, when I say your Zenza is reusable, I don't mean we use the same drop of Zenza for each and for the same part, two separate But there's clients. too much in there just to use a bit and throw it away, right? <laughs> of course. We want to reuse it for multiple clients. So, when we're using this, we dispense this out onto our disposable trolley or our disposable tray, and then we put the rest of it away in a completely different trolley or a completely different area for us to be able to reuse this next time, yeah? Much the same as with your Feel Better, your pigments, um, you want to dispense them out before the skin is opened. Once the skin is opened, then we do not touch any of their bottles. We don't yeah. go anywhere near them at all, yeah? Now what happens if you do need to go back to your bottles of pigment? Well, you take the gloves off. Yeah. Get rid of your gloves. Yeah. Again, using a method of turning your gloves inside out so you're not contaminating your hands. Then you're going to reload your pigment yeah. ring 
making sure that your bottle doesn't touch your pigment ring. It's no point in air being, dropping. yeah, air <laughs> dropping, I like that. Um, there's no point in taking your gloves off and being really clean if then the nozzle of your bottle is going to touch that yeah, dirty exactly. ring. Yeah. Um, you reload, you put your bottle back, you re-glove, and on you go again. Oh, of course. Um, so yes, you're, you're wanting to keep that habit of keeping everything separate. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So yeah, so disposables, reusables, it's always important to keep them as separated as you possibly can. Okay, so other essentials. Now the first other essential that we already spoke about. We've spoken about this one though. It's, it's, <laughs> in, my, it's in, in my makeup bag. If, for no other reason, just get one for your makeup bag. <laughs> Honestly. It's a great concealer, it's a great highlighter. It is. I've got it under my eyes today. <laughs> I've got a little bit under my brows, I've got some under my eyes, I've got a bit of the sparkly bit under my brows. I say, and it does come in two shades, it comes in a medium and a light, um, and with the beautiful shimmery <laughs> highlighter. Yeah, on the other add end. a little bit of um, finesse to, yeah. your, to your pictures afterwards with a little sponge applicator to spread yeah. that through. So it can be used, to say, for your after pictures, for yourself, or even, as Alice said, which is a great tip, for your pre-draw, mm -hmm. to hide any spots that you want to hide yeah. before you carry out and either remove hair or you've got any bits and pieces that you need to um, eliminate before you start your procedure. So, there are two things that we haven't spoken about so far. Are these? Can we see these? Are we around the right way? No, we're not. Let's go that way. <laughs> okay. Magic Mistake Eraser and your thinner. A bit thinner. Okay. So, your Magic Mistake Eraser. Now, this little guy isn't designed to be used as a full removal product. Just number powerful. one. It's very powerful. Okay. The best time to use this product is if you have made a slight mistake straight away after your procedure. Yeah. So, for example, you may have done someone's brows and you may have maybe done one little stroke a little bit. A little bit too little long. Bit too low. Maybe you've added one yeah, more on the end that you don't want. Maybe there's a stroke just through the front of the brow, which is making them slightly uneven. This is not a, um, it's not something we plan to use. No. Right? Generally, I. In my classes, I don't tell a lot of people about this because I don't want people to use it as a safety blanket. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but however, it is there. And it's, it's a nice safety there. blanket it's to have. It's a nice safety blanket to have, but then if you've always got it there, yeah, it's, it's not, to be used. It's to be used. It's, it's to be, you, you want to have it, but you never yeah. want to use it. That's it. But it is, saying that, it is amazing. Okay. So it's amazing to remove any pigment there and then. Yeah. You can then obviously just place it in to the stroke and what you'll see is obviously you stroke, almost see the pigment rising to the surface okay another little tip it sometimes does make the skin around the edge go a little white so yeah. in which case if it does you can add a little bit of your fill better around the edge and what that will do is that will stop the whiteness and the whiteness to disappear now okay. i actually used this the other day on um, on an eyeliner client she was a lady um, that had quite fragile skin and a number of years ago, she'd had a little milia removed from just underneath her eye. Okay. And because of the wiping with the eyeliner, a little bit of the carbon pigment had gone, you know, it wasn't implanted with a needle, but it was just where that skin was ever so sensitive, even though it was years ago. And it left like a little beauty spot mark. Bit of this on there, came back, nothing. Perfect. Nothing there. So okay. I'm very it, pleased that I had that mm, there, just in case. I mean, it can be used. Say, for example, your client does come in, say, four weeks later, and you have noticed there is still a stroke there. Mm -hmm. There's a stroke there that maybe shouldn't have been there or maybe looks a little bit now out of place. It can be used, but it's not as effective no. four weeks later. Yeah? So you, it's would most, just go, you would just go you would just in and just open the skin, the stroke yeah, or reopen and, the skin. And go back in but it is most effective to be used there and then on the individual strokes, mm -hmm. not the whole brown. Absolutely, handy, okay. handy to have. Very handy, handy to have. To have. Um, as is the pigment thinner. Of course. Handy to have. Um, if you do machine work, uh, any of you that do machine work will be familiar with needing to have your pigment the right consistency. Mm. And different size cartridges um, might have a better flow of pigment than others. 
Um, this is again to be used sparingly. You just put maybe a drop, sometimes two, in the um, in into your pigment ring. Give it a little mix with a micro yeah. brush, and um, just to loosen up that consistency. The great thing about Everlasting Brows pigments is that they're so highly pigmented that what you're not really doing is diluting no. the pigment. You're just changing the consistency. Yeah. But you can also use it to dilute. You can do. So if you were doing something like an ombre brow, um, you might have two pigment rings or two pots of the same pigment. Um, and you might want to do the first couple of passes with something which is, you know, got two, three, four drops of this in, which is going to be the same tone, but a lighter saturation. And then go back in with your next passes with your, you know, with something that's less diluted. Um, also for lips, I know that um, especially beginners with lips can sometimes be a little bit heavy with the, oh, yeah. with the lip, with yeah. the outline. And by using, you know, by using the same tone but having a uh, pigment ring which is which is thinner, um, it's going to be a bit more diluted. It's going to be a little bit more forgiving on that outline. So, um, you know, hand hand is an addition. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Okay, so pre and post care. So we've already spoken quite a bit about the juice effects. Yeah. Now, what haven't we spoken about? We haven't spoken about post care. So important. Of course. So, so obviously, important. without your obviously your normal after care, as we normally say, be careful obviously of saturating the brows with water. I would say as well, be careful obviously with picking, pick pulling, rubbing, scrubbing the brows. We don't want too much touching or feeling of the brows. We want to avoid heavy exercise, exercise sweat. Any excuse, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> Gents. <laughs> um, but also, what are we putting on our brows? So, we do have ourselves. We've got sort of the ever after kits of what we, what it's we like, like to call It's them. like a dual use product. It's right. They yes. come together as a pair in a so, packet, in a, in packets to be given to your clients. Really. Yes, we do. Yeah, you, they do come smaller and they can be used during procedure mm -hmm. as well. So you have, first we have your ever soothe. Okay. So your ever soothe is like a cleansing for your brows that you can use at home. Okay. This is going to help to cleanse the brows, reduce any inflammation. Um, and it's also going to help the healing process. So a nice cleanse of your brows at home, because sometimes people just put cream or and cream. And they're, they're that wipe, aren't they? They're like also, the wipe, like uh, yeah, they're before. also a large wipe, exactly the same as obviously the juice, not exactly the same, the same size as a juicy pad. Okay, so there is, it's also got some rose water in it, which mm -hmm. is really nice and soothing for the skin. And uh, using those and using those in a wipe, um, delivered in a white means that the client hasn't got to worry about using any cotton rounds yeah. or any tissues or any foaming cleansers or anything like that. They're just going to give a really good firm wipe over, remove any lymph, any lymph remove any bacteria, yeah. and just maybe one, any remaining. Just we don't pain. want like a back and forth motion. We just want a nice, a nice firm, nice wipe. firm wipe. Yeah. Okay. So we not only got these little guys. What else have we got? We've then got about? the Ever Nourish, mm -hmm. which is like the step two. Yeah. So your nourish is literally what it says on the tin. It's there to nourish the brows. Okay. Um, there's a mixture of apricot and peach oils in this. It's just again going to help nourish those brows to promote healing, um, and to keep the skin obviously nice and nourished. And as you said, these can both be used afterwards, can't yeah. they? So if you've so, got a bit of pigment which isn't shifting on the skin, you can open one of these to right because they're because they're formulated for use yeah. on open skin, on fresh brows. You can use these to to have a really good clean up afterwards. And because they're so saturated, we don't only just have to use them on the brows because you obviously you'll put them on your brows, you'll clean the brows, and be like, hey, there's a little bit left over. Beautiful for your skin. I like the um, the consistency of the Ever Nourish, which is um, almost like a slightly oily yes. consistency, like on my lips. Yeah, really, it's really lovely. hydrating on, yeah. on my lips. Beautiful and hydrating and um, for your clients' brows. Now you can have them in smaller packages. You can use them during procedure. If at the end of your procedure you want to clean over your clients' brows, you can use this guy. Yeah. If it's again throughout the procedure, sometimes when sometimes the pigments are a little bit highly pigmented. I mean, as I say, we've said this earlier, especially for lips, sometimes clients get a little bit of a mess. An eyeliner, my eyeliner. My eyeliner. always look like they've been working in a coal mine. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
finish with them, honestly. So you can just use this and that will just remove any extra. It because, does, it makes yeah. them human again. So you can either use them during procedure or we do do them in like boxes, little take home packages, which to be fair, your client can purchase off you. Or if you're going to buy them, you can just um, incorporate it's them into the another really rice. nice thing in that aftercare kit. In that aftercare kit. I mean, in this aftercare kit, there is um, 14 of each. Okay, so there's 28. So it, so there's a week's worth because you would want to do this morning and an evening. Yeah. Okay. And that's obviously what the aftercare kit comes in. As I say, incorporate in the price or they can buy it as an added yeah, extra. This is a premium treatment, right? Yeah. I mean, exactly. you know, premium treatment, premium aftercare just makes sense. Exactly. Just makes obviously, sense. to promote the best healing, which is what we want. We want that skin to heal nice and firm. We also want that pigment to be staying inside those incisions. Okay. Oh, oh, too far, too far. Okay. So a little bit about pigment knowledge and aftercare. Now, obviously, we're just going to touch on this subject because that is a whole... It's a whole webinar in itself. <laughs> and we've it? noticed that we haven't stopped doing it already for two hours. <laughs> we've met Yaya already. Yaya is one of our, um, one of our best sellers. Such a rich, um, was it breathtaking dark brown? In fact, she's my favourite. Yeah. What is it? Your favourite? Yeah, Yaya is a, is a must-have. For me, it's a must have. It's just a beautiful colour, just beautiful. I do know you've also got another favourite. Do Belinda's one of my favourites. <laughs> I've got a real crush on Belinda. But <laughs> Yaya and Belinda together are beautiful. Um, I do a lot of hair stroke work. A lot of my ladies are mature, so they need a little bit of warming up. Um, and Belinda is uh, is called a flaming a flaming brown. It's almost like when you put it on the skin, it's like a brick red kind of colour, a red brick um, a brick red brick brown kind of colour. Um, and a drop of this in Yaya just lifts. Yaya's quite warm anyway, but it just lifts it and adds that little touch of warmth, like an insurance policy to those yeah. more mature skins that it needs sometimes. Um, I mean, I Julie, Julienne is a great modifier. Yeah. Um, but 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 Julienne has got some might behind her. Oh, got to um, see. Yeah, she has. Yeah. Belinda is Belinda's not. Gives a little lift. Belinda gives a little lift. But um, Belinda can be used for when we're talking about your warm and your cooler colours. If a client has got, if you've got a particular cooler colour, you can use your Belinda even in any cooler colour. I love just Belinda yeah. in Kim. Yes. I love I love, love a little bit of Belinda in um in um Naomi. Naomi. Um, I'm getting a little bit jealous of Belinda. Yeah, Belinda's Belinda's a <laughs> Belinda's a good one. Um we've also got Salma and Tamara here which are, are also part of the best sellers. Are these three in Monica's row? Yes, they are. So if you've not used Everlasting Brow Pigments before, they're a hybrid pigment. They're really, really nice and creamy. They heal incredibly true to colour. And we have a starter kit, which is called the Monica. Is yes. it Monica's Ray? Yeah, Monica's Pigment Collection. Monica's, yeah. Monica's Pigment Collection. And that's five? Yeah, there's five of her favourite staples. Yeah, yeah. And they there. really are, aren't they? So if you're, if you're thinking of, if you're wanting to try something new, something different, um, those five are mm -hmm. a really good start. But you know, if you're not sure, message us. Kelly and I love asking your question, answering your questions. Let us know what kind of colour, maybe perhaps from a different range, tends to be your favourite, um, and we can find something that's going to sit tonally really nicely for you um, to give them a try. And I, I, I promise you, once once you try, you, you'll you'll always come back. back. Yeah, you'll always. And come we do back. have actually a pigmentology webinar as well. We do available, yeah. um, which can literally get you into the. The nitty gritty is finding out obviously how the pigments are sort of made. There's so much technology of and innovation that have gone into these mm -hmm. pigments. It's more than just saying to a, 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 um, a scientist, make us this colour. Yeah. Um, the in a lot of depth thought nature, and love as yeah, well. Love. <laughs> as there is behind all of our products, of as course. I mentioned before, one of the things that I really, really love about this brand is that they're all ethically sourced, thought about from a perspective mm. that, that they're going to make a difference of course. to the work that the artists are doing. Absolutely. What's your favourite pigment? My favourite, my favourite is Yaya. Is it? Yeah, I do love Yaya. Um, I just love the richness of it, I love the warmth of it and I love the depth of it. I just feel it can give you a really yeah. beautiful finish. It is, it's um, lovely. And as I say, obviously, with any of the pigments, you can sort of mix them together. You can change the tone slightly. You can 
lighten it as well. If you need to darken it, you can darken it. Um, with or need the pigments, obviously matching it to your client's hair color, eyebrow hair color, should I say, is obviously a must. And when you get that collection, if you get that collection or you get some other colors to have a look at, take them out of their packaging, open the, give the bottles a really good shade, yeah. Have a really have a good look at them. Look. Have a look at them on your skin. See how they spread. Have a look at them on some white paper so you can really get an idea of that tone and that base. Um, because that is really important that you understand and that you get to know your pigments. That and you also get to know. put them on different skin tones. Yeah, one thing I've always said, it's another thing I can use it to the same to classes. In, classes, in all my classes, the I get the class. pigments out, I get sort of three or four different pigments. I will get the students around and we will put some on the back of our hands to have a look because no two people have got exactly the same skin tone. That will give you a reality of how the pigment looks mm -hmm. dependent on the, the temperature and the depth and the colour of your the each individual skin. Because they say, not one colour, the colour is always going to be the same colour in the bottle, but obviously if the, the canvas is different... Skin is going to look yeah. very different to Kim on my skin. If the canvas you're working from is slightly different, the colour's going to be slightly different. It's not going to change the colours so much. It's just going to be These different. pigments are lovely. They they fade really stably, so they're not going to fade out to a crazy salmon colour or to like a crazy grey blue. Mm -hmm. um, they've been formulated to be true to colour. Yeah. Um, and I so said, lots and lots more innovation there. Check out the pigment pigmentology webinar. You'll learn, learn a lot, um, not just about our range, but in general about in pigments. General. Okay. Okay, blazing cartridges. So obviously, depending on obviously whether we're going to be doing non grey or whether we're going to be doing micro blading, or if we're going to be doing both combined Combine. together, yeah. you're going to be using either a blade or your cartridges. Now, blades for me, more talking about your shape and the thickness, um, will depend on obviously your skill, especially with the shape. Yeah. Now, personally, I prefer a U blade. However. When I'm talking um, to my beginners or with any, anyone starting out or anyone that's unsure, I would always go for a classic blade. Now, my reasoning for this is because with a classic blade, you've got a wider surface area that you're mm. using. And because you're using a wider surface area, there is more resistance on the skin. And for that reason, that stops you from going too deep. Yeah, it's, the, whole, it's yeah. The, the, the guy lying on the bed of nails, isn't it? If you lay yeah. on a single nail, you're gonna, your skin's going to get pierced. If you're laying on a bed of nails, yeah. you can, you you know, your resistance and your, your pressure is better. Yeah. Okay, with the U-blade, you only tend to use like the tips of the U-blade. And if you're only using the tips of the U-blade, as you were saying, you're more than likely to go a little bit deeper. Now that does make curves much easier to it make. Does because, it again, it, because again, the amount of needles you're using mm -hmm. is smaller, therefore it's easier to manoeuvre. But it's, a it's, bit like easier, a lobby, it's also a much bit. easier to go too deep. And yes. we know that going too deep is the enemy of a good brow mm. procedure. Um, coming back to the story I was telling about my mature skin lady with her um, microblading. Um, a, you know, a U blade just would not have been at all of to use yeah. in that in that scenario. Um, but all of the blades in our range are really great quality. Yeah, really great. Quality. Double sharpened. Yeah, yeah, and that makes Double a difference. difference. Yeah, that makes a difference. You know, a sharp blade is going to give you a crisp, even stroke. You're going to need. You're going to be able to deliver your pressure more yeah. consistently. Um, it's more comfortable for your client. Um, they're, they're, they're very affordable, our blade range as well. Um, I think that there is a misconception sometimes that, um, that, that good blades need to be overly expensive. Mm -hmm. and, and our blades are, 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 very, are very affordable and they're, they're wicked. They're really good. Um, so someone's saying about when we buy pigment, do you have information about the CI code for each bottle? Absolutely, yeah. yes, we do. In um, fact, most of the information is actually on the website. It is, yeah. So if you go onto the website um, and you click onto the bottle of pigment that you want, it should have product attachments written next to it. Click on that and all the information for the pigments will come up for yeah. you. Yeah, all of the information about all of the ingredients and everything that we do is totally transparent. So that's easy for you to find. 
Um, they're also REACH compliant. They always, they, we've, we've had no yeah. major formulation changes. We've, we've not needed to. Um, yeah. You know, for those of you that are in the EU or in the UK and are concerned about the new regulations coming for REACH compliance, mm -hmm. um, if you're a, a pigment user with Everlasting, that's something you don't need to be concerned yeah. about because it's, it, we, we already comply. Okay, back to blades now. Different types of blades. We're obviously generally within our um, basic training. Obviously, we do explain obviously the different types of blades, the different thicknesses, and the different shapes. Yeah. Now, generally, our blades come in a range of three different thicknesses: a zero point one five, a zero point one eight, and a zero point two five. Where would we use zero point two five, Alice? So, a point two five is a slightly thicker blade. Mm -hmm. It's still going to create an incredibly thin stroke, but yes. it's slightly thicker. So you would be using a slightly thicker blade if you had someone with a coarser mm. um, brow hair because we want to mimic what that hair is doing. Yeah. You also might be using a slightly thicker blade if you were a beginner because it holds a little bit more thicker. Okay. Um, so for a beginner to use a slightly thicker blade, mm -hmm. um, again, they're just a little bit more forgiving. They, you're not going to be able to go too deep quite as easily as you again, might do. Yeah, brings you back to resistance. Yeah, brings you back to resistance. Yeah. I mean, the 0 0.18 is a beautiful blade for, say, a sort of someone that's got sort of a, I say, normal, normal, that's a good all normal, rounder. All rounder, right? 0.18. Now, your 0.15, who's heard of the nano blade? Yeah, the 0 0.15 is your nano blade, okay? It's going to give you the really fine, crisp lines. And that's um, all that nano blading means, right? Yeah, there is I mean, no magic formula, I've seen, it just means a smaller blade. I've seen a lot of people saying, hey, come and train in the new trend of nano blading. It's this, it's that. It, it's micro blading with a smaller blade. We've, and, been, doing, <laughs> we've been doing it for years. You've probably, you've probably been doing we've it been for years. years, years and not realizing. Not known. <laughs> Okay, so that's the main difference, obviously, with your blades. Now, also, you can obviously take into account, obviously, by using your different pigment colours. Obviously, the thicker the blade, the more pigment it's going to hold. Yeah, I did a beautiful lady, um, a beautiful lady with Asian heritage this week, who had very, very, very fine hair, very, very fine hair. And although the 0.18 is normally what I would go for in that particular circumstance, it was 0.15. Um, you know, she, she wanted something that was very barely there. Her natural hair was very, very fine. Um, and so this was the, this was the selection that I chose in that circumstance. Right. I just want to, I'm just aware of time, looking at stretch, depth and retention. And then ladies, get your questions ready. So we were asked a question about practicing um, depth. We've covered stretch and the importance of stretch. Mm -hmm. How would you say is a good way for students, or not even just students, but anyone to know the right depth um, with microblading, the right depth with PMU? I mean, it's all to do with how you're using your tools, number one, mm -hmm. yeah? As I say, we haven't yet invented this amazing machine that's gonna measure no, not yet. <laughs> it's going to measure how deep we're going to go. <laughs> um, but as I said previously, when you are doing that first pass, get used to the skin. Yeah, we always know when we're going too deep. Now, for example, if you are, if you have a client, I know I was talking about someone bleeding, but obviously if there is a heavy amount of bleeding coming through the skin most clients you won't see no. most clients see spotting if that if that yeah if tiny bit spotting so those of you that were taught to see spotting a lot of the time that's too deep yeah a lot of the time you will see limb to see spotting is okay but we're not looking, looking for, for it. that um, because generally you will see sort of a lymph, which, yes. which is generally what carries, carries, carries a plate of blood it's, it's clear and then it might come through again yeah, depending on the yellowing. Fitzpatrick of the skin, there might be a little bit of blood in there, there mm. might not be. Um, you know, the, the Fitzpatrick for Asian heritage lady that I did this week, no lymph, no blood, Just nothing. Thing. But if Just she had been fixed one with pale skin and ginger hair, <laughs> then then you could pretty much yeah. guarantee that I would see more spotting. So there is a bit of knowledge that comes in to just kind of knowing skins and knowing what you might see. Um, a good way to practice, you know, you've got your latexes, but also things like fruits are good. You can use you know? fruits, yeah. Um, actually being able to measure that depth 
is difficult because it is going to depend on the skin. Each individual is so different, and that's yeah. why it, that's why another thing is to work on, especially when you've just first come out when you first training. Um, another thing is to work on as many mm -hmm. ages, as many different skin types, as, as many different ethnic ethnicities as you possibly yeah. can, to be able to get a whole. They're all going to have their own age. personality in the way that they that they are. So, in terms of giving you a definitive way of practicing depth, that's a real difficult one. You know, use different types of latex. Yeah. Use different. You know, use fruits. Um, see what the difference feels like on a banana. See what it feels like on an orange. See what it feels like on an apple. You will find that that feels different on each thing um, in the same way as it will feel different on people's skins. And then look at the skin. So whatever um, kind of feeling that you're taking from practicing, transfer that over to when you're working in the skin and look for those signs. Look for the signs of um, you know, very, very little bleeding, spotting at a maximum. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, sound, some people say sound. You but can, sound's but different sound depending on the skin type. It's also different depending mm -hmm. on the skin type. What you want is that connection and that vibration on the skin with your microblade. And you can always check. You can always check that you've left a mark. Yeah. Once that mark is too deep, you can't, you can't, take you can't pedal back from that. So in actual fact, sometimes it's better to sometimes work a little bit lighter mm -hmm. because again as we said all what i said you can always add you can't take and you away. can check your strokes so those little micro brushes that you were talking mm. about um you know if you've if you've worked nice and cleanly and you've only worked with a little bit of pigment on your blade there's nothing wrong with taking a micro swab and just checking check the skin that, just checking that you've got a mark there before wiping away if yeah. that helps with your confidence and if that helps um you know anything that's too light we can always we can always put a, we can always revisit with a little bit more pigment um we can always revisit at the root up yeah um and for pmu for machine it gets that said, vibration yeah it's the vibration it's as vibration. i said you're only ever using the tip of the needle we're not injecting the color ourselves mm -hmm. what we're doing is we're making the skin vibrate the needle vibrating as soon as you feel that skin slightly vibrating then obviously that's almost like you you're there. Practice on a balloon if you get time with your make, with your machines. Um, blow up a balloon, not all the way full, but sort of you know half halfway. And practice on a balloon. If you're the balloon should not pop. The balloon should you should be able to work on the balloon, or you should be able to work on a glove on the back of your hand without um, without that popping, without that scratching. It is that the the top layer of the skin it's is so so, so thin yeah. um, but the, the problem that comes with practicing your depth is it's going to be totally different for each person and then of course obviously you can see when your client comes back for the top up yeah so you can see that um i mean especially with your microblading or even with your pmu if they come back after four six weeks and there's nothing there we, we can do, go again we can go again number one but we also know but we may need to add just a little bit more. Well, usually bit more a little bit more saturation. Yeah, usually. More saturation. usually is it more saturation more pigment, than, more, yeah. than more pressure. Um, it's very rarely a problem about pressure yeah. retention. Very rarely, if ever. It's always about pigment retention. It's always about your pigment retention, your stretch, getting the right consistency, if you can, of depth. I say, and that can be really frustrating as a new artist creating but something. And that's what we say. And, that's and what the experience is for. It is, yeah, yeah. And, and it really is a case of time on skin. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah, time on skin. Time on skin and practice. Indeed, it is. So is that our last slide? Yes. We've done Every okay time. with the time, you know, Kelly. <laughs> we weren't sure when we started that we were going to be able to talk for this long, but, but we've done okay. Well, we can talk with this long for as much mm -hmm. as we want. Um, guys, have we got any other questions? Um, I feel free. We've got a few more minutes um, before we have to wrap up. So let me know what questions you've got. Um, Please let us know what you thought. Has the information that we've given you been useful? Um, have you learned anything about treatments, about products that you didn't know before? What's the correct way to stretch? I never seem to get this right. My biggest challenge. So this is why, if we saw earlier, obviously the correct way to stretch is to make sure the skin is nice and flat. We're not trying to manoeuvre the skin around. We want to make sure the skin is nice and flat. Now, working on the brow area, the best way is using a three-point stretch. And where those fingers are placed is going to change depending on where you're actually working. Yeah. So if you're working at the front, 
you might be you might placing be two fingers and one down here. When you're working at the sides, you might be pulling the brow up onto the brow bone and then pulling down. It's going to depend. But think about think about trying to create a triangle mm -hmm. with one, two, one finger, one or a thumb or, or two fingers, one, two, and then your, your working hand, your pinky or the edge of your pinky is going to pull out creating like a triangle, which will then move along wherever you are. Um, a two point stretch is okay, um, but your three point stretch, that's that's where, that's you, that's where your money is. You yeah. need to get your three point stretch. Three point stretch. And as we said before, it's also your supported hand as well. Um, and you know, you can practice that. You don't have to be doing a procedure on someone to practice your stretch. Get your mum or your dad or your aunt or your cousin or your husband or your girlfriend or whoever it is, your kids, and practice your hand placement. You know, we often forget that a lot of these things we can practice without actually yeah. piercing the skin. And mapping, mapping is the that's exactly where I was going. Mapping is the best thing to practice. You don't have to be doing a procedure to map. Yeah, and it's something that people struggle with so much. So, you know, just get your clients in and say, hey, just come in and I want to map you. Let me let me have a play. Let me get the string out. Let me see where my hand position is. And then when you actually are in that real life scenario of a treatment, then um, then you'll be much more confident. All right, just a few more questions. So I would like to ask about top ups. Is it four to six weeks or six to 12? I've lost you. Okay. So when we're looking at top ups, this is this is something which um, a bugbear is probably strong for me, mm -hmm. but I personally would never do a retouch at four weeks. I tend to go to six at least. Mm -hmm. Now we have to understand the reason why is is to understand why we have it at this time frame. Our skin has a regeneration phase of around twenty eight days. Now twenty eight days is really only if you're 21, you um, do hot yoga every day, you eat broccoli and you live on Instagram. And what I mean by that is no one's skin really works like that, unless you are very young, very healthy, um, you're living a stress-free life. Yes. Like us, <laughs> like us, like us. I mean, I think mine's probably less than 28 days. Mine's about two weeks. <laughs> so for most of us, um, most of us, our skin cycle is gonna be a little bit longer than 28 days. So by pushing your retouch out to six or eight weeks is a bit of an insurance policy to say that the skin is going to be adequately healed. Yeah. It's going, your color is going to be more settled. Mm -hmm. The treatment's going to be more comfortable. Um, I actually even prefer to do mine between eight and 12. Oh, you do? I yeah. do. Um, you know, but I certainly, for me, six weeks for the vast yeah, majority of my clients yeah. is, a, is, is a minimum. Yeah. I've and also it depends sometimes on your client's age as well, as you yeah. say. So if someone is of an older age, not getting back to the age ladies, but getting back to the, if someone's of an older age, their skin regeneration is going to be yeah. a lot longer than that, as you say, of a 21 year old. Yeah, you know, if someone's 21 years old and the only time they can do their research is in that four week window, yeah. then then that's that's acceptable. But obviously, I would still probably rather do it at six. Yeah. Um, but if they're, all, you know, if they've, if they've let's say they're getting married or they have a big birthday coming up or they're leaving the country to go and live abroad or whatever the reason is um is it possible yes is it preferable you're yeah. you're more you're preferable to pushing out a little bit yeah okie dokie so very oh messages messages oh look yeah hi christina good i'm glad you enjoyed all your tips revisit stroke all right okay so danielle um do you just revisit strokes lightly at the top ups? I tend to, yes, go back over the strokes that we've already created in um, in your first or in your initial treatment. Um, and that is because obviously what we're going to be doing is we're going to be implementing a little bit more pigment to make them strokes a little bit more visible. Mm -hmm. I think you have to, again, take each client on its own, like, on its own merit. Um, a lot of my clients, when they come back for their, um, for their retouch, um, are now feeling a bit more confident about yeah. going a bit darker, which they might not have been in the initial treatment. Or well, you as a therapist might be might be feeling a little more confident going a little bit more darker as well. Absolutely. So if I'm wanting to make the brow darker, then I will revisit all of my strokes. Yeah. If my client is happy with the colour, but I just maybe have a couple of broken strokes mm -hmm. um, or or I want to add, then that's what I'm doing. I'm looking at the brow and I'm making... I always say to my clients, 
How's your brows healed? How was your aftercare? Come and take a jump up, let's have a look. We're gonna have a good look through your brows and then we're gonna come up with a plan. Because again, each one is slightly different. This is the um, thing with permanent makeup, we can't have, um, I don't know, say Mary and Sarah, and both Mary and Sarah have exactly the same treatments, have exactly the same skin, have exactly the same healing process. The two cases are going to be very, very different and very, like, yeah. very separate. So we, we can give you a, we give you a general And as a life. beginner, you're probably going to need to revisit all your shows yes, because your retention definitely. might not be quite so good. You might have those broken shows. They might have healed a little bit lighter. Um, Kelly and I are probably at a point in our career that if someone's got good skin and we've been on point with our technique, but there's not really an awful lot to do on a retouch. So a lot of the time, if the client's happy with the colour, it might even be a case of saying, well, it's been lovely to see you. I'll see you in a year or two for your next treatment. Um, in reality, most people have some little additions that yeah. you want to do. So you revisit the strokes that need more depth, more depth. or need repairing. Mm -hmm. Anything that is healed as you want it, you leave alone because every time we enter the skin, we're, we're increasing the risk of that stroke um, blurring or migrating. Because you um, don't also then want to increase put a stroke next to... Absolutely, and we're creating trauma that doesn't need to be done. So, um, yes and no. <laughs> we answer for that. Well done. <laughs> Depending on the situation. Absolutely. Okay, we've got one. Will you be doing a webinar regarding correction colour theory or recommend any other courses. We do have, um, Danielle, we do have um, a pigmentology course as well. I mean, it's something that we can look at if there are any other webinars that you guys are interested in. Obviously, me and Alice, as you probably gathered, as you say, like talking, like talking brows, <laughs> like talking pigments, like talking everlasting. Um, we'd be more than happy to obviously share our knowledge with you all as well. Okay. So I think it's about time to um, wrapping up. Wrap up. Time to say goodbye. So I will be. We will be sending you out an email, ladies, this afternoon. Um, in that as well, we are going to give you a very lovely discount code to say thank you very much for joining us. Um, I really, really hope you've enjoyed it. I mean, we've loved it. That's <laughs> it. I'm like, we'll do this again. Yeah, we? we'll do we'll this do again. Do Same time again next week. <laughs> Please do let us know. Please let us know. Like um, also, it'd be great if you could leave us a review on either Google Reviews um, or Trustpilot. We're on there. It'd be great, obviously, to get feedback as well. Or even just send us an email with feedback to tell us if you enjoyed it, if there's anything you'd like us to add. Um, but yeah, we would like to carry this on. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you um, so much for watching. Thank you so much for having enough passion and care about what you do to be continuing your education and your knowledge. And we look forward to seeing you all soon. Okay, you take care of yourselves. See you later. Enjoy your treatment. Take care. Bye-bye.